as possible. Uh, we also have very limited space out in the lobby for the public. If they want to come here to the DAO, we are utilizing proper medical screening questions and social distancing. This meeting is also being live streamed. Um, our mission statement, our mission is to provide a safe and caring climate and culture in which we engage, inspire, educate, prepare, and empower all learners in partnership with their surrounding community to be successful in today and tomorrow's society. Um, school board members, please remember to mute your microphones when you are not, speak, not speaking. And uh, I've been told the shortcut on your PC for muting your mic is control D on your keyboard. During tonight's meeting, I would ask that a board member, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the chat option. Um, Tammy Delan will be assisting me tonight and watching the chat and let me know if I miss somebody. So I apologize if I do. Um, we'll now call the meeting to order. It's 6.33. Today's date is May 20th, 2020. I'm here at the DAO and we have many people at remote locations. Um, Les, could you lead us in the pledge, please? Chair Pores, Dr. Green just had yeah. some technical difficulty. It froze up, so he's getting ready. He's rejoining. He's rejoining. Okay. Okay. So we need to go ahead and do the Pledge of Allegiance without him. Oh, okay. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, invisible for liberty and justice for all. All right. Now, um, next up would be roll call. If Les isn't here, I'll wing it. All right, let's start off with board members. Uh, Jeff Porres is here. Shannon Hawes. Here. Zach. Here. Al. Here. Monica. Here. And, well, well Lutz will be here eventually. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Excuse me. Um, I've gotten a message from Sylvia that she's not able to uh, hear audio. She's exiting and coming back in. But just so you know, she's having some audio difficulties tonight. All right. Tammy, can you take roll on all the execs? Um, sure. Uh, we have Gary Ganji, executive director of operations with us tonight. And I'm doing this randomly, sorry. Uh, and Lori Posh, who is the executive director of learning and teaching. We have Marsha Baish, executive, or excuse me, assistant superintendent of elementary education. And uh, Lori Putnam, a, assistant superintendent of secondary education. Uh, we also have Tracy Flynnbo, Executive Hello. Director of Human Resources, and uh, Executive Director Adam Holm of Community Education. We have Director of Equity, Al Dahlgren. Mm -hmm. ex excuse me, Al Johnson. <laughs> we have... Uh, Sorry about that. We have Executive Director of Business and Finance, Amy Scalarud. We have Executive Director Carol Potter of Special Education and Student Services. Um, sorry, I'm seeing if I missed anyone, and I apologize if I have. And of course, Superintendent Willie Jett. I'm not ever going to miss him. I think also, that's. And then also, did Dr. real good. Hey, also, Dr. Green is there. There we go. You did there real good. Is. Listen, <laughs> well done, Tammy. Listen, uh -huh. and then, uh, you are going to probably have to continue to do the, the or someone will do the uh, uh, clerk's job. I am sitting in my truck with the telephone hotspot because <laughs> the internet went down. All right. <laughs> I'm in Minneapolis. Uh, I can do and that. I no papers with me. Uh, you all look very good. So you guys go ahead. I will uh, I'll turn my mic off and participate as a member tonight.
I heard Shannon. All right, thank you, Les. Uh, I heard our vice Shannon, chair. Shannon, I heard that you're going to help with the roll call. I mean, the uh, votes. Yep. Uh, thank you. Votes. Lori, yep, would you mind that. introducing the guests that you're also going to have on board tonight? I will. We have joining us um, the three lead coordinators, and you'll hear more about them during the presentation. Jill Lip is here, Kristen Dolman Stoll, and Kara Mather. All right. Thank you much. Tonight. And Jeff, before you go on, just for clarification, did we need to say where we were? Yeah, technically, you have to, to be in accordance with the thing. So oh, just board right. members, state your location, your reason why. And start with uh, Shannon again. Oh, tonight, uh, I am at my home residence because of <coughs> coronavirus and social distancing. At home in St. Cloud Zach? to avoid getting this virus. Al? District office, governor's orders. Uh, I'm Les? a pickup truck in uh, uh, Brooklyn Park in a parking lot uh, uh, because the governor has ordered us to, to not uh, meet together and I'm following the governor's orders. Thank you, Les. Natalie? Uh, I am at my home in St. Cloud for the governor. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, tonight, the consent agenda. The consent agenda consists of non-controversial items that the board routinely adopts without debate. Any single member of the board may remove an item from the consent agenda by requesting removal at the time the consent agenda is moved for adoption. The full text of items can be found at the end of the agenda. On tonight, we have item number A, approval of tonight's agenda. Item number B, approval of minutes from our meetings that we held on April 15th and May 6th of 2020. Item C, approval of payment of bills and other financial transactions in the grand total of $3,795,881.30. Item D, we have the approval of staff changes. Item E, we have the acceptance of grants and awards and donations. Item F, we have the approval list of the graduates from Apollo and Tech High School. Item G, we have call for bids, sale of MacBook Air computers. Item H, contract award for nutritional services primary vendor. At this time, I'm looking for a motion to accept the agenda as recorded. I'll move, Al. And I'll right, second. Al may, was that you, Natalie? Second. second, Les Green. Okay, Al and Les will run with it. Um, you want to take roll call, Tammy, I guess? Or no, Shannon, I'm sorry. Shannon, you're up for roll okay. call. Okay, roll call. Natalie Ringfoot. Yes. We'll come back to no, that. No, yes. I, I oh. pressed Control-D about five times in the That's okay. So, yes. Okay. <laughs> Natalie, say yes. Les Green? Yes. Zach Dorholt? Yes. Monica Segura-Schwartz? Yes. And Haas is a yes. Al Dahlgren? Yes. And Jeff Polreis? Yes. Thank you, Shannon. The motion passed. Uh, we are now moving into our informational items. First up is item number A. It's curriculum review cycle, fine arts, health, and physical education. It's going to be done by Lori Posh, Executive Director of Learning and Teaching, and her three fellow presenters tonight. Go ahead, Lori. Thank you. I'm going to change over to my presentation screen here. And Board Chair Paul Reese. Superintendent Jett and school board members, thank you for the chance to be with you tonight. And I just clicked out of it. Um, this is always one of the highlights of my year is being able to share with you the good things that are happening in our curricular areas. So I'm gonna switch over and again, I can't see you once I switch over. So if somebody can tell me, can you see the presentation? Yes, Lori. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, I can see. I can see it, Lori. Great. So again, providing our updates each year is always one of the highlights. I love being able to showcase our contents and our programs, our successes, and also talk about some of our challenges. And tonight is no exception. 
We always start each year by looking at our curriculum review and development process. This is the third year that we are talking about our fine arts program. If you look at the chart, you can see that our um, fine arts was actually set to be totally implemented this year, but we knew that we needed an extra year to really look more closely at it, to see what additional purchases we needed, as well as to con continue to look at staffing of our fine arts. I could use a full board meeting for each of the areas that we're talking about tonight. I received hundreds and hundreds of examples and pictures and quotes from parents and students and teachers about the fine arts area, FIAD and health. Our areas tonight are vital in fulfilling our mission of helping our students to be successful in today's and tomorrow society. So our priorities for this year were to continue to look at our courses to see if we needed any new course options, to recommend any purchases, to look at sustainable staffing, and to make sure that we are continuing to look at equity across all sites for both staff and students. When I think about our areas that we're talking about tonight, they are so evident in our world, especially today. We have headlines at, on our district sites, in city news, in national news, and world news. Our Apollo band students were highlighted as they held a surprise outdoor performance for their band director, Mr. Zahn. We have art appearing with artists giving free lessons online and art appearing in windows and all over. We have family music videos being posted as families join together to sing and cities sing to salute our workers and to be together. We have FIAD challenges like our FIAD teachers and then our principals challenging each other to beat the pros in fitness challenges. And we know that we have health in the news every single day. These areas are helping many people cope with our present reality. But these areas also help our students to be active, creative, and problem solvers. The three people that I have with you tonight, I could not be more proud of the hard work that they have put in, not just this year, but every year. We really wanted to have more direct teacher input in these three areas as we looked at, at the um, conclusion of our fine arts, health, and FIAD reviews. So with us tonight are Jill Lip, who is our FIAD and health content lead, Kristen dolman Stahl our content lead for visual arts, and Kara Mather, our content lead for music. This year, we were able to add both Kristen and Kara's role as point two of their um, FTE and overload to be part of the review. Normally, I wouldn't be presenting alone. I would have a member of the learning and teaching staff with me to share this information. But these three people are live in our meeting, and I can only hope that I represent them well so we're gonna start with arts education. Our focus tonight is going to be, as I said, arts education, health, and FIAD. Arts education is sometimes misunderstood. When we think about arts, we sometimes think about the visual arts. But our state has identified five areas that count as arts education. And those areas are dance, media arts, music, theater, and visual arts. Our students can earn credits and standards in any of these five areas. The state requirements for K-8 students are that we offer, that each district offers at least three of those state identified areas and that our students meet the standards in two of the areas. In our high schools, we're required to offer at least three of the areas and our students are required to meet the standards in one area and fulfill one year of required credits, um, of required courses, or three semester credits. Our course options include um, both middle school, elementary, and high school. The state asks us to look at four processes that are fundamental to the arts, no matter which arts area that's in. And those four areas are creating, responding, performing, presenting, and connecting. And I think you'll see some of that tonight. I wanted to make sure to draw your attention to some of the courses that we have offered that meet the art standards that aren't always thought of as arts classes. Some of our courses that you see on here are electives that our students can take, but do earn them that art standards. 
Offering a wide range of interest choices for our students is important to keeping our students connected and engaged. These aren't new courses, but as I mentioned, they're just not often known as arts classes. Our focus tonight, though, is going to be mostly on the two areas that we um, talk about the most and that we have the most options in, and that's our visual arts program and our music program. So let's start with visual arts. Our visual arts program really look at the development and usage of grade level at a glance documents. The goal is being able to provide students, parents, homeroom teachers, and new to the district teachers a better understanding of what skills students are gaining from year to year in the art classroom. The studio Habits of Mind were in the forefront while the document was being created to reflect the changes in the new national art standards. The studio Habits of Minds not only engage and help students in the elementary art classrooms, but also help them build a solid foundation for life. We're hopeful that as we expand and build on our arts program, our students will have all of those core foundational skills that are needed to take them to the next level in art. I'm going to let these pictures just kind of run through for you. And a great picture to end with. All of our teachers and our students have adapted to um, the, the difficulty of being in distance learning, especially in these areas. You'll see throughout the night some recommended purchases. For our arts program, we have been able to purchase a program called the Art of Education. All of our teachers K-12 are very excited to have access to this and also to pro learning and flex curr curriculum. This has been especially helpful in the, our, as we navigate online distance learning. The company, although we're purchasing it for next year, graciously granted us access to it already this year so that our, our teachers could start learning and our students could use it. Pro and Flex will provide online and on-demand learning opportunities for teachers, such as new methods, techniques, and strategies, as well as professional development. On Thursday, May 7th, our art teachers attended an online training with a representative to learn how to better utilize the platforms. Each platform grows by three lessons or topics of study, and they're easily adaptable both for, to in-person teaching as well as CSUN Schoology. We're also looking to purchase iPads for every art elementary art classroom so that our students can utilize all of the technology that goes along with our resources. And you may remember when we were at Apollo that we had art display boards that our, music, our art teachers came around and changed. We will be adding those to our DAO as well. Previous purchases have included um, a new kiln for South and other resources for our art teachers. When I say they're recommended purchases, we are still in that budgeting phase and I know that you have not adopted the budget yet for next year. So we're looking through all of our recommendations to decide which ones we'll be able to purchase for next year. Music. Our music offerings are as vast and varied as our art offerings. As I mentioned, all of our areas have been able to transition to distance learning. Students begin their musical journey in our preschool and elementary buildings. Musical choices begin in middle school in performing groups like orchestra, band, and choir, as well as newer courses like drumming and making music. That choice continues into high school with performing and non-performing groups for options. The Minnesota Arts Standards develop student musicality in the four core arts areas that we talked about before. Students explore those areas by learning about the history and core ideas behind music through singing, listening, rhythm with instruments, dance, and integrated technology. Last year, we added with partnership of community at our community youth choir. And our staff and students have won numerous awards throughout the state and nation. A few more pictures to see.
Recommended purchases at music. Our music um, classrooms, last year we purchased some new middle level instruments to help with our students who can't afford the rental fees or the purchase of instruments on their own. We also added drum pads to Apollo. And you can see on here, again, many hands-on activities and purchases. We purchased a new curriculum, both at our elementary, middle, and high school, in order to build that consistency and that scope and sequence for our students. And now we do have to talk a little bit about staffing for the arts because that has been a question that's come up this year. I don't wanna spend a lot of time here and take the focus off of the successes of our students and staff, but it does need some clarification and some information. If you remember from previous years, staffing of the fine arts has been in every presentation and will continue to be reviewed. Like all contents, Staffing is, is an area that involves input from budget standpoint, HR, district, and building perspectives. Like every content, staffing for fine arts ebbs and flows each year based on student enrollment, building and grade level, and student registrations. Some years the budget allows for an increase in staff and other years it does not. The chart that you're looking at shows the staffing levels in three areas. I added creative expressions because we added that course as a theater option for our students. We also have staffing allocated to other courses that students can earn the art credit in. I did not include all of those on this chart. So let's take a little closer look at music because as I mentioned, that's where we have a lot of questions coming up this year. When we look at staffing, no matter which content, um, our building principals are given their FTE allocations and then have to make hard choices about how to divide those allocations between the contents. Staffing in all contents fluctuates, as I mentioned before. When our principals are looking at which courses to hold, they look at the student registrations and enrollments. So for the 2015-16 school year through the 2019-20 school year, those are actual numbers of students who were enrolled at the end of the school year, so in trimester three. Our 2020-2021 numbers are the student registration numbers. So we don't know exact enrollment numbers for next year until the school year starts. On the right, you see a chart that our principals use as they're determining allocations in their buildings. The first number that you see in each of the areas is the number of staff that are allotted based on student registrations. So when our principals are looking at this, they average um, an FTE to be about 160 students. So that would be the equivalent of a full-time teacher. We know that that number differs for our teachers. It may be higher, it may be lower, but that's the average number that they use. So the first number is the number that would be allotted based on the student registration. And the second number are the number of positions that were allocated at each building. You can see that we were lucky to have a few years where we were able to allocate additional staff um, that were above and beyond what the staffing would allot. Sometimes principals have that extra flexible FTE that they can use, um, and sometimes they don't. Our hope would be that we could always have more staffing than we do. We can't present, oh, I wanna point out as well, in 2018-19 and 2019-20, because of where we were in the curriculum review process, we um, agreed to add additional music staff so that they could continue to build the programs from the high school level. So really reaching out to our middle schools, our elementary students, and really building that pipeline, almost like a varsity coach would do, to build the programs at the buildings. And we can't present about music without hearing it. Our staff and students created a recruiting video to show to our fifth graders because who better to recruit our students than other students? The full video is on our agenda and also on social media, but I wanted to show you two little clips because they did such an incredible job along with our communications department. Thank 
We know that music and any talent doesn't start when you get to high school or reach that peak. The teachers also went through each of the areas, band, orchestra, and choir, to give our students an introduction to what the individual instruments look and sound like, as well as what they sound like together. And here is our band, part of our band. So much talent we have in so many areas. We're going to switch to health now. The purpose of health education is to positively influence the health behavior of individuals and communities, as well as the living and working conditions that influence their health. Health education improves the health status of individuals, families, communities, states, and the nation. All school districts in Minnesota are required to identify standards, benchmarks, curriculum, and assessments in health education. All students must receive instruction in health education in their K-8 years, and those can be district-determined grade bands. Our high school students must receive instruction in health education at least once during their high school um, career, and the amount of that credit is determined at the district level. The Minnesota Department of Education recommends that teachers use the national health standards, education standards. These standards establish, promote, and support health enhancing behaviors for students in all grades, and they provide a framework for teachers, administrators, and policymakers in designing and selecting curriculum and instructional resources. At our elementary levels, our um, health teachers, our licensed health teachers, have actually developed our elementary health curriculum. But the instruction and implementation is provided by classroom teachers. Along with our district curriculum, healthy, healthy Living is also supported by SNAP-Ed, University of Minnesota Extension Office through the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Grant. And our units addressed in elementary health include hygiene, healthy habits, safety, and relationships. At our middle schools, our students participate in six-week rotations of health in grades six, seven, and eight. We were able this year to pilot, pilot an updated health curriculum through Goodhart Wilcox, the publisher this year, and we're excited to be using their health resource again next year. Similar at high school, as I mentioned, we have one trimester required, but we do offer many additional classes in our health areas for students to pursue. Physical education. Told you I could do a whole night on each of these areas. Physical education in elementary, we have all new state standards implemented and embedded in our curriculum. We have so many awesome teachers and activities going on in this area as well. Our elementary teachers are excited about the new equipment purchases that have been recommended for this coming year. Along with um, traditional physical education courses, additional moving activities are encouraged by staff and enjoyed by students, such as walkathons in the morning mile that you're seeing here. As I mentioned, our K-12 teachers are really excited to have some of that new safe equipment coming next year. Lifelong fitness activities such as rollerblading, cross-country skiing, and biking are highlights of our elementary curriculum. At the middle school, we'll be fully implementing the new state physical education standards in the 2021 school year. At the middle level, we've adapted more of an individual fitness model of education in order to meet the new standards. 
This includes the use of iPads and fitness testing technology to help students understand how physical education goes hand in hand with staying healthy. Our middle school students learn safety and proper use of the rock climbing walls. They also get to add new activities such as pickleball, archery, and badminton to the list of new activities in school while honing their fitness skills. At our high school level, we're also fully implementing the state physical education standards. One of the newest focuses in the curriculum is on individual fitness through creating fitness plans to reach their chosen fitness goals. To fulfill graduation requirements, a high school student must complete two trimesters of physical education, which includes fitness for life and a FIAD elective choice. In high school, our FIAD students spend time in, in the swimming pool, playing basketball, disc golf, volleyball, and more. We also, as you know, as you approved, a new racket sports class, and we're offering all of our classes every day for a trimester. This will allow our students to take more physical education elective courses if he or she chooses. And you'll see our list of recommended purchases. This is only a sample of the purchases that are recommended for our physical education classes for next year both for safety reasons and to make sure that we have equity across our buildings. I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up our career fields, clusters, and pathways document. We often think of this as something for our um, CTE programs, but really this is the foundation for all of our courses. It's preparing our students for that next level. That center area that shows and talks about foundation knowledge and skills are highly, highly evident in the, the areas that we talked about tonight. Those employability skills, ethics, teamwork, problem solving, critical thinking, and safety are all enhanced in our fine arts courses, our health, and our FIAD. I was going to give you a little quiz and make you go around the career wheel and talk about areas that you could see our fine arts, our health, or our FIAD. I'm just gonna point out a few to you. If we start in our purple, area. That's our arts communications and information systems. And that's where we usually think of our fine arts um, landing with things like performance-based performance, performance -based careers, web and digital communications. But as we go around in our orange area, our engineering, manufacturing, and technology, we have careers in construction, design, health and safety, sales. Our red area, health, safety, and technology. Obviously, health fits in there but also things like music and art therapy, physical therapy, research. Again, all of those skills that our fine arts, health and FIAD programs help to develop. And our blue area, human services, teaching in any of those areas is always first on my list, but also mental health and areas that we can serve our community. Green, business, oops, gold, let's do gold first. Agricultural, food and natural resources, I think of our courses that um, offer the culinary arts, um, some of our marketing courses that fit into here that are all parts of um, what it takes. And I think I skipped, I have them wrong on my list. Gold is actually business management and administration, marketing, um, jingles, advertisements, lodging, travel. And then our green, agriculture, food and natural resources. When we think about our healthy foods and all of those areas that are involved in those career fields. So what's next? As I mentioned, we're going to be finalizing our budget. We'll be looking at what purchases we're able to um, give next year and in the upcoming years. We'll do a continual review of our staffing and programming. Our career or our curriculum review cycle is set up so that it's never truly over. Every year we're revising, we're looking at and seeing how we can do better. This year we have hit, if you remember a few years ago, the, the school board designated money for catching up all of our curricular areas. And we did some major purchases in almost all of our content years. This is the year that those renewals are due for some of our online um, platforms. So part of our budget will be um, making sure that all of those renewals for our online resources are caught up again this year. In 2020-2021, we move into language arts, English language programming, and science as part of our review. 
and as always, we'll continue to celebrate our staff and our students. We have two pictures on this page, um, and you may have read about this or heard about this, but we want to offer our congratulations to two newly announced students representing St. Cloud District 742 in the 2020-2021. Faizina Ahmed, who is a violinist and 10th grader at Tech, was named to All-State Orchestra, and Garcia Lopez, an 11th grader at Tech, to All-State Choir. We're gonna end tonight with a quote from Faizin. And this is a portion of the quote. When he was asked to give us some um, quotes to share with you tonight, his quote was so long and it was hard to even cut it. But I'm gonna leave it here for you to look at. With a huge thank you for your continued support of all of our content areas as we move on for next year. And now I'll stop sharing and answer any questions you have. All right, we will start off. Al, do you have any questions? Jeff, may I? Not right off, before, no. Jeff, excuse me, before we start with questions, there is something in the chat if I could address. It, it's regarding live streaming. There, um, we are. No, it's community members who are, are um, either on the Facebook page or, or texting board members that are having difficulty it's from um, a board member? finding out how to, to access the live stream. So could I make that statement right now before we do questions? Take care of that part. Okay, uh, the, the board meeting this evening is being live streamed and that link can be found on the district website. Uh, if you go to board meetings, remote board meetings, both the link and the user password are located there. Uh, that information, the link and the user password also can be found on the district Facebook and uh, Twitter social media accounts. So I think perhaps people might have been trying to access the link without the username and password. And, and you, need, you need to do all those steps. But, but those three places, um, you should be able to access the meeting tonight. And that, that's what's in the chat. Thank you. All right, thanks for clearing that up, Tammy. Is there a way we can put that info out there for the next meeting so it's easier for them to get on? Um, I think maybe what we should do is announce Tammy. it at the beginning of Yes. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be great. Can you hear me? Yes, and so bottom line, Chair Polarize, Tammy is saying yes, we'll figure out a way to make sure that we okay. announce that. Um, and you're, publicize that um, so that everybody, being that that was the first run. You're lagging pretty bad. Pardon me? Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Sounds good. All right. We're going to keep going with the questions. I'm going to go in order. Les, do you have any questions? Questions? No, just a comment. Excellent presentation, Lori. You you always seem to outdo yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Green. All right, Monica, do you have any questions? Yes, um, uh, Lori. You also have said before that. Um, so in in the enrollment in music, very specifically, uh, could you tell us about the number of students that we have in entering ninth grade? Monica. Here? Yes. Can you hear me? Hello? Um, so, Lori, can you tell me about the number of students that we have entering ninth grade this year compared to the other uh, past years? Uh, is, that, is that number equivalent or that has any impact into the enrollment in music? Monica, I didn't pull exact enrollment numbers. I'm going to see if... Um... Amy has them or if Lori Putnam happens to have them handy. I apologize, I didn't look at total enrollment numbers to have with me tonight. Yeah, but my question is about, does that have any impact over the uh, enrollments in, in music classes and, and the uh, need for teachers in those classes? So the 
enrollment of all the total population of students going into ninth grade this year is it the same as the other years? Monica, I could comment uh, if that's okay, Lori. Um, what I can tell you about our high school enrollment is that um, we are about 50 students um, fewer coming into the next year for projections. So we need to accommodate, of course, for that, that slight decrease. Thank you. All right. Anything else, Monica? All right, no, Natalie, you. it looks like you're up next then. Uh, yeah, so we spent a lot of time talking through this presentation um, and beyond in uh, the Achievement, Integration and Equity um, Committee meeting. So I just wanted to thank everyone that was there um, and thanks for all, uh, we, we had a lot of feedback from um, teachers and parents um, of music students and art students, um, you know, that, that are incorporated into uh, when we discuss these sort of things. So, um, you know, that is my college degree as a music educator. And so uh, this sort of stuff is really important to me. And just as a, um, a parent of um, a person who, uh, a little girl whose favorite art teacher is on this call right now, <laughs> and um, to boys who have found their people in band. Um, this is such an important part of one of the reasons why we continue to choose 742. And so um, thanks, Lori and team for, um, I got to get Lauren over here so she can see you, Ms. Tomenstall, but uh, <laughs> she loves you. But yeah, thanks for all of your work on this. I appreciate it. Our board chair seems to have stepped out or having technical difficulties. So I'm just gonna step in for a minute, Shannon, if that's okay. Um, or, or you can lead it, Shannon. I was just looking to see, is there any other board members that have a question or comment? Zach? Okay, Zach. Zach does. Um, I feel a little selfish addressing it this way because uh, just to bluntly put it, if, if it weren't for band, I, I wouldn't be where I am today. I don't know if I would have graduated high school in a normal manner. I probably wouldn't have gotten to college, at least not right out of high school. Um, so seeing those participation numbers um, going down, which I know is not, is, is not a, a local trend. This is sadly something we see um, you know, nationwide to a certain extent. Um, just wondering, what kind of efforts can be made, are being made, and, and maybe how can we, as the board, others be helpful to, um, do I dare say, re recruit more people into to music um, as someone who, a firm believer of it, it saves lives. So. I would agree. And, you know, I think that all of our contents are so important. Um, and music being way up there for many, many, many people. I think that what you see in our recommendations will help with that. So having a consistent um, curriculum and platforms, K-12 that our teachers can use so they're not recreating and creating their own lessons, um, allowing some of that individuality that is so important to still come through though. Um, our purchases for instruments, that has been a huge piece for us. We have many, many students who, as I mentioned, can no longer afford to rent an instrument or to buy an instrument. So that's a large part of our requests is instruments that our students will be able to access. And you notice even at the elementary level, making sure that we're getting instruments, getting a variety of music in the hands of our littlest kids right away. Um, the recruitment video efforts, I cannot say enough about what our middle school and our high school teachers do and their creativity and trying to reach out. I think this year was a unique year because 
they weren't able to do some of those visits to our elementaries and junior highs where they do the band concerts, the choir concerts. Um, and I, I think that is such a huge piece of our community and our outreach both community-wise and within our buildings. So we will continue to work on that. Um, I know that our music teachers are committed to it and we're committed to it as well. Other board members? Go ahead. Uh, oh, Zach, sorry. Thank you. Just a thank you for everybody's efforts and that, um, uh, if you need help, uh, don't be shy about reaching out. Um, if there's anything I can do as a board member, um, I'd like to lend my efforts where needed. Kara, did you hear that? <laughs> Thank you, Zach. Shannon, I saw that you're- Yeah, saying. yep, I have a question. Um, well, thanks for the presentation. Oh, and my dog's gonna bark here, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, and I love the idea of that, that video and reaching out to the younger students to talk about instruments and their experience with band. What message goes to um the students and the parents then as a person who in parts of my life where if my child would have brought that home i would have said what does that cost and and kind of blocked it so is there a message um instantly before a parent would say no but could say you know the child comes home enthusiastically and wants to play the trumpet and it's going to cost money. Um, are we communicating anything about financial options for them? And I'll let others chime in as well. I know that um, my understanding, and Kara, please correct me if I'm wrong, is that that is on some of the information that goes out to families. Um, I also know that our counselors are always reaching out to help. Um, I, I can't speak specifically about each building and the efforts that are made, but I know that we are are trying to communicate that in as many different ways as we can um, with our families. Part of that is making sure that we have the instruments then available that we can help our students have access to. So we instruments are not cheap. Um, we have talked with a couple of organizations over the last couple of years about even possibly doing an instrument drive. Um, we've heard of some commu communities that have done that where people have instruments at their house um, that they're not using anymore. And we've been able, some communities have been able to get instruments donated that way. I'm also in conversation with LEAF. And I see Kara chiming in on the chat um, that it is communicated and money shouldn't be a reason not to join. I know that we have worked really hard at trying to get that message out. We also have wonderful community partners with our um, music companies who have offered discounted rates and have really tried to help out. Thank you very much. I would think even some students would be um, sort of aware of their family and those choices. So if they would hear the message up front too, to say, and you know, this is an option for you. Um, and you can tell your parents when you're talking about it to them that there are you know, instruments here or other options than having to buy one. Jeff, nope. Mona. Oh. nope, Tammy, hold on. Um, I know that I'm going to just step in because Monica said she had a question. And so I know that Jeff, the, the chair at the moment, is getting something fixed with technology. So I'm just stepping in. So, Monica. Thank you, Willie. Um, um, I watched, Lori, can you tell us a little bit more about how um, art offerings, uh, music, and all the art parts are working right now during distance learning? I think our leads might be best to chime in with that. Um, the creativity that I have seen in lessons is amazing. At the last board meeting when I shared with you, I shared with you the seesaw examples of art and how our teachers were incorporating art into those lessons. Um, yeah, um, they're doing their thing. <laughs> I will let um, our leads chime in. I know that it's been a challenge, but I know that it's something that they've been working on. Kara, do you have anything to add from the music standpoint about that? It's not ideal. No. Hi, everyone. Um, can you hear me okay? Wonderful. Um, 
one thing about music that everyone can probably agree on is the social part of it. So I'm not going to lie, this, this, how we are making music, um, it, it's, it's difficult when we're not together. Um, but we have been doing some fun projects. Um, we have been using one of uh, the free online learning resources, Smart Music. Um, we've been implementing that um, and kind of doing a, a, a trial run on that um, since we are looking at purchasing it for the fall. And it's been a great online resource for helping with practicing. And we've also been doing, um, although we don't have the technology to quite do the virtual choirs and orchestras and bands, we, we've been doing little things like that and, and working on projects um, and sharing them. So there, there is, there are ways. I, I think you can do a balance of both, actually. Um, and some of my students who are more introverted, and I think all of the music people can say this. Some of them have been thriving in in this um, way. They, it give, this gives them another outlet um, to to do music. And music, of course, is not just performance. So we have been doing other aspects of music education. Um, as far as visual arts go. Um, we have, I think, risen to the challenge um, K through eight um, and beyond into high school. Um, it's different, I guess, with what I see um, in the elementary world. Um, I'm pretty partial to those little kiddos. Um, and from the very beginning, um, we kind of started off um, talking about just what this means and how we are still artists, um, no matter if we're in our studio that's at school or we're in our studio that's at home. Um, and from day one, I know, um, talking with the K-5 group, um, we, we meet every week, twice a week, just to kind of problem solve. Um, but that was a message we got out to our, our, our students as well, that we can do this. Um, it's going to be hard, but we do hard things. We know we, we, we can do this. And um, we're already creative problem solvers in art class. Um, and a lot of those pieces that were on Lori's um, chart um, with the foundation knowledge and skills and the employability um, skills, um, those are things that we do in art, that we do in music, um, in FIED, um, every day. We are creative problem solvers. Every day we are, we are engaging and persisting in hard things. And um, it, I think the hardest thing is just not having that, that contact. Um, I get lots of messages about, we miss you, we want to be in school, we miss our friends, um, but we're we're all getting amazing art. Um, we've had to kind of think outside the box, which we do anyway, as far as materials. Um, not all of our students have pencils or paper. Um, and I believe the school board was gracious to give um, donation or somehow we had those school supplies go out. So thank you very much as art teachers, as families, um, we appreciate that. Um, so even just checking in with our artists, the first couple classes, the first couple weeks and saying, you know, tell me about your art studio space. What do you, what do you have? Um, I have some kids who've done every assignment on their iPad. Um, I've had some kids who are using, you know, the back of junk mail because we're recycling, um, or we're going through a recycle boxes and bins. So, um, we've been good problem solvers and it's amazing what kids can come up with, um, when you present them with challenges. So. Of course, it's not ideal, um, but we've all said this is for the best. Obviously, we want to stay healthy um, with our families, but they're doing it. Um, the kids are doing it and they're doing an amazing job. Yeah. Jill, anything to add for Fayad? Sure. Um, as Lori said earlier in the presentation, we are actually working, um, our new standards are being implemented fully this upcoming year at all levels. And um, it's very individual based. And so what a great time for kids to learn about individual fitness. Um, you know, so we've kind of turned our attention to that direction and have found out in a hurry um, that at all levels, kids are preferring choices of activities that we could give them. And they like the independence of being able to say, um, I walk my dog versus I'm not doing the 30 jumping jacks or something along those lines. So um, we learned that in a hurry. And um, being creative has been really fun. The online resources have just been, you know, crazy fun. We have kids juggling with socks at home and playing badminton with whatever they can make a racket out of. And um, 
you know, and for us, the weather was a bit of an issue. And when we could get them outside where it was safe, you know, and that we could be a little more creative and have fun with things. Um, we've been doing a lot of discussion posts for kids, just tell us, you know, giving them ideas and they're, we're letting them write some own fitness goals and make some of their own plans. But um, our elementary people, of course, are crazy creative. You know, I think that's part of what elementary people, those brains are just different than high school brains, I think. Um, and they made a really great video and challenged our students you know they were the professionals and it was a, a really cool thing i think Lori showed or has that piece so if anybody wants to see that but um again our kids have been great you know it's different it's challenging we don't have equipment in their hands but it's been a good time for us to plan individual fitness and get them kind of moving in that direction um we have some new stuff next year um where we're offering our class every day next year for um a trimester so that's going to be really fun we get to redo that curriculum this summer and our kids i think that's going to be a great thing moving forward but um we've had great response and kids checking in and you know being an, a more of an academic piece and having them have to turn stuff in to us versus just showing us what they're doing um it's been a little different you know we didn't the fitness testing is you know we didn't get to do that this spring but um they're staying active they're staying busy they're being creative and um, we're getting what we need out of them and it's been awesome so we're really excited about some of the new um requests that we've had for purchases um at the especially in the health and the pe some of our equipment you know or that we're getting so we can all be on the same you know the same page with our testing and everything so we're very excited about the upcoming school year and um it's been good it's been challenging like everybody has said but it's made us all be creative. I'm, I'm learning to be a computer genius and who would have ever thought that? I mean, honestly, so <laughs> it's been good, but, um, thank you for listening to us. And Lori, you did a fantastic job presenting for us. And so thank you. Jeff, come, yeah. you want to step in? Okay, the next person was uh, yeah, Matt. Yeah, I see that, uh, it was, yep, Natalie and then Al. So Natalie, start off. Thanks, Willie. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to piggyback on what all those wonderful women just said and say that um, some of the most um, emotional times for me seeing my kids through this distant learning, distance learning has actually been a video from Ms. Domestall and then also a video from um, Mr. Zahn, um, Quinn's band teacher, and just, you know, it didn't have a lot to do with art or music necessarily. This first, the first video they sent out for the kids when this all went down, you know, it was like what me, Ms. DM was saying, um, you can do hard things and we can do hard things together. And Lauren needed to hear that because this, um, my dad, for my daughter, this was a really hard transition for her. Um, as far as ninth grade band teacher goes, you know, he was really, um, he said, I'm here for you. If, if it's not a music thing, I don't care. I'm here for you. Let me know what I can do to help you. And so to have champions um, in our in our teachers um, and have them be uh, specific and explicit about that in their videos to their students has meant everything to my kids. So it's been really beautiful. Um, just wanted to let everyone know as well that although we did have uh, in our achievement integration and equity committee, we did have a talk yesterday in our meeting about this very issue. Um, we're actually having a broader discussion about this as well in the summer, specifically around equity in the arts. So when we talked about at the end of 2019 in this committee, what do we want to be talking about in 2020? Um, that was one of the things that came up. So the reality of some of our programming um, when it comes to uh, theater or um, band or choir, orchestra, um, when I go to those concerts with my kids, um, there, are, there are times when I'm looking on the stage and I see a lot of kids who look like me um, and not an equitable ratio of kids um, of other ethnicities or other races uh, that we know we have in our school. Um, I think that there's a lot of, I think that's something that we need to talk through and, and we will be talking through in our committee meeting, specifically about equity. 
And when you bring in as well, um, not only equity when it comes to um, kids who are non-white, also when you bring in that, that equity piece for our kids who are on free and reduced lunch or just over that gap, um, you know, even though I get so many things from band, our band teachers saying, money is no issue, make sure you reach out to us. Um, there's still that, that uh, the fact that you, ha you have to reach out and say, yeah, I, I can't pay for it, will you help me? And that I think isn't something we've figured out yet as to how to make sure that, you, because there's so many times when our families that are in free and reduced lunch have to ask that, and that's hard for families. So, you know, how do we ensure that when someone sees the band or the choir or um, uh, after school art classes, um, that they see themselves in those classes, um, not only uh, across the spectrum of our, our kids of color and, and our white kids, but also no matter what your parents' income is, that that is something that is for you and it's for everybody, not just for certain um, parts of the, our population. So that, again, like Zach said, that is a, that is a, a nationwide issue that we're dealing with, but um, we're intentional about naming it and talking about it and, um, and coming up with continuing strategies to make sure that we're serving all our students equitably. It looks oh, like Jeff. Yep. Or Dr. Wayne. Green. Uh, yep, Dr. Green. Go ahead. All right. I have Jeff's no idea. Thank you for that question, Monica. Al, I see that you have a question. Hello. Oh, crap. No. You're good, Al. <laughs> yeah. Al, go ahead and hit that red button one more time. We could hear you the first time. Go ahead, Les. Yes, can Al, I can hear you. OK. Uh, um, so I had a question. I'm going to go back to the to the curriculum, uh, the, the new curriculum that we're looking at, or the curriculum that we're looking at, and specifically in health. Les, mute um, your mic. We've all been so visited we'll several times by a certain member. Can you hear me? Yeah. I love these meetings. <laughs> these are just great. Al, we can hear you. Yes, you can hear? Yes. OK. As I said, I love these meetings. This is just great. I and mean, half the time is spent technically. Um, so OK, I was talking about the health curriculum. We've been visited several times by members of the public or a specific member of the public who throws a book in front of us and says, "Can you have you seen what they're teaching in health? Where does this curriculum that we selected fall on the level of controversy uh, as far as uh, teaching all sides of, of the arguments or the of the conversations? And is there any surprises in here that we would expect that we yeah, as board I mean, members would somewhere mm -hmm. down the road be hearing from members of the public that, hey, this changed in, in your new curriculum? Right. And, and then uh, so I'll let you answer that part first. Thanks, Al. I want you to know that as we looked at it, um, I did share all of the information that our community members have brought forward. So both Jill and Leah Sams, who helped support our review, were aware of all of those concerns. I don't think that there is any curriculum out there for health that will not have something that some people deem as controversial. Um, so we have standards that we have to cover that have to do with relationships and family life, um, that we have some 
community members who would like to see that not covered at all. Um, I can say that as we looked at it, we took all of those considerations into account. Um, we also have reached out to some of the members of, um, of our community who have some different religious and cultural views to have them look at it and review it as well. So I, there will be something in there probably that somebody is opposed to. And that is without, with following the standards that cannot be avoided. Al, I can speak to it a little bit as well because uh, like Lori said, Leah Sands and I were both part of, a huge part of that process. And um, we actually are getting the most, you know, we're requesting the most current piece of that curriculum, which would be out in May here actually this year. Um, and the curriculum is aligned with the national health standards. And um, so those are, those are what it is meant to do. And those are what it covers at the elementary levels. Um, our health teachers, along with myself, put together the curriculum at the elementary levels. And that is, you know, that can be shared and that can be looked at whatever um, it's on a in a folder that we have that we're using. Um, and the new stuff that we're getting is is really good. And like Lori made a good point, there's just things about the health curriculum that not everybody is going to agree with or support, but it's part of the national standards um, and it's part of what we're expected to deliver to our students. So um, we're really excited about it. It's wonderful. I mean, we've like um, a couple um, other people have done, they've allowed us to use the curriculum kind of to pilot it this last, since March, they were, we, um, some of our health teachers have been able to use some of it already. And so um, that's what we'll be giving our students K, not, or excuse me, six, nine. So that curriculum is what will be given to our kids at the um, middle level as well and in the ninth grade classroom. And so um, it's adapted with Schoology already. It was embedded in Schoology. And so we were able to get a hold of that a little bit earlier, which was awesome. But um, it's it, it's aligned with our national standards. It's the newest. It's the best we could find. You know, it's the best one that we found. And we're really excited to have it and offer it to our kids. And we're educating the whole child here. And, and, and as you know, we are in a pandemic and health is a major piece of what we need to be educating our kids on. And so um, we're excited to have this and, and our health curriculum is gonna be fabulous. So I hope that helps. And I'm not, and I'm not trying to put any of, the, any of you on the spot as I know that the curriculum isn't something that you wrote, it's something that you're purchasing. One of the difficult, things for a, as a board member though, is we are always, well, we are, no curriculum gets purchased without our approval. And, but we never really have the opportunity to see or read or have any idea what's in those curriculums. And in one such as health, is there any way that we could get a, a, like a, bullet listing or maybe some a listing of some of the more controversial things where we may get questions so that we would have answers prepared or at least some idea. Because usually that someone asks me, do you know you're teaching this? And I'm like, we are? I don't know. I'll have to talk to somebody and see because I just don't have any, I, I don't have any idea. And that goes for any subject. They can, they can say it in math, science, any subject. Because uh, we do not personally review those curriculum so except for the one person that may fall on the curriculum committee or something but that it, it becomes kind of a sticking point and if there's a new curriculum in health we may see some more questions from community members so I'm just wondering if something something to help us uh, get absolutely we can get that to you and actually, Al, I have, I can get you a copy of the scope and sequence. And I actually have some textbooks of the brand new curriculum that were just delivered to my house um, the other day. So if the board would like a copy of that textbook, um, Lori, would that be okay to share that? Okay. So if that was something you would like to look through just, and it would have us, we could get you a copy of the scope and sequence and what's covered at the high school and the element and the middle level, if you'd like. Thank you. Okay, I know that they're, <clears throat> they're still working on Chair Paul Race's um, reception. And so I think I see that Dr. Green's um, 
microphone is ready. So his hand went up. So Dr. Green. Yes. Um, two things um, in terms of, you know, I, I sat through, uh, not sat through, I participated as a parent in uh, watching a, a child uh, go through a uh, band and orchestra and those kinds of things. And I also noticed what I would say is the lack of people of color in, uh, in those activities. I think that uh, when we talk about equity and talk about those things, there is a need to read, uh, let me see, how can I put this? To redirect the responsibility for engaging children in band, in the arts, to parents. Um, uh, on the one hand, the other is to maybe look at the options we provide. If you were to provide provide a uh, a drum and bugle corps, for example, uh, that uh, some, similar to the Minneapolis Elks, for those of you who are old enough to remember that that kind of rhythmic beat that those young men uh, were pulled off the street and participated fully in that kind of drumming behavior. Uh, uh, Major Tops was an interesting man who, uh, or Major, I can't, I think that's his name, who would uh, pull these kids off of uh, the street in the afternoon and they required to do an hour worth of homework in order to, to be able to participate in this drum group. The other is a step group, which you will see in, in, in black colleges and in and, and black schools that, uh, that really hook and draw in uh, people of color. The other side of that, and I agree totally with Natalie, I don't care how much money you have available to give away to people. If you require that I walk up to you and say, please give me some money, you have created a barrier that simply some people are, are just not going to pass. The, the result, the, 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 probably the option is to let's, let's look at absolutely, totally free um, activities. I mean, if we're going to look for a solution to, to both, to all of those things, first of all, make it free. Secondly, uh, make it uh, create a more vast array of, of opportunities for people to participate in, uh, in those kinds of things so that it, it attracts uh, a different, different group of people. That's one point and I can expand. I'll, I'll think about that later on and try and make it more, more reasonable. The other is on the, the health issue. I think that, that I, I agree totally with Al on this, um, but I don't need to read it. I think what I need to know is that our people will recognize where controversy is going to come up and that they, they tell us this ahead of time. Listen, this is, this is gonna be a hot issue. Uh, the other thing is that I, I realize that we can send things out to different cultural groups but I don't want to compromise or allow uh, the perception of, uh, of anybody who does not fully believe in the equality of women to have any impact on the kind of curriculum that we put out in health regarding social emotional relationships. That, that our, we have to, to, we've been fighting this equity battle too long to even think about uh, suggesting that in order to accommodate something or someone, that we would step back in terms of the equality of women, no more than we would step back in terms of the equality of people of color. So we have to be very careful about, about how we, we engage and bring people into the process of, uh, of helping us figure out what we should, how we should teach health and those things. So I'll be quiet there, but that I just that was my three and a half cents worth. Thank you for both of those points. All right, I'm back. I was over at Culver's grabbing a bite tea. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> and you know that's humor. Um, did everyone get a chance for questions? All right, I think I'm last. I just want to commend all you ladies. That was a great presentation. Great input from the board. Thank you very much. Lori, anything to close out or are you ladies good? I, I have something. We are good. Oh, Willie, I'm sorry. Yep, that's all right. Thank you. 
Um, and, and so just the, the three, so Lori, okay, I have conversation with Lori Post all the time, but the, the other three ladies, so Kristen, Miss Dolman Stahl. So I heard um, one of our board members, Natalie Ringsmooth, she gave you rave reviews because she talked about her children. They just love you and everybody in the school at Westwood just loves you. So I'm gonna echo that and say, thank you for all that you do. The other two, and, and so Miss Kara Mathers, and, and so I just need to make a comment because I watch or I've witnessed the care. So they're, they're leaders in our district as it re relates to their curricular area. But in terms of their individual impact that they have on young people, if you watch this, it's truly amazing. Um, I have a I had a daughter, well, I have a daughter and, and I have a son who are, were in music. Um, but especially I remember my daughter being petrified um, as she was doing something in orchestra and the care and concern uh, that this individual that I'm looking at on the screen that she displayed with my daughter, I'm, I know for a fact that she does that as she's dealing with all of the students throughout District 742. So I just want to say thank you for that, Ms. Mathers. And then Coach Lip. And as you see, I said Coach Lip. I didn't say Miss Jill Lip. I said Coach Lip. And, and so um, I witnessed her over the years uh, do some amazing things. It doesn't matter if it's with track athletes, with, with in health and fi ed, or, or with a young lady that we know that's at Eastern Illinois. Um, she's just done an amazing job um, in terms of the bonds that she's established with young people. And so for me, the three of them symbolize the excellence that goes on and the relationships that they build with our students and their parents out in the community. It's truly amazing. So I just had to say thank you, ladies. All right. Thank you, Willie. Uh, I'd like to thank Ryan Cox for getting me a new computer. It was a thank you, Ryan. Um, next up, we are going to have our school update portion. But before we start, I'd like to say that we did receive 16 questions or concerns through our public input site about graduation ceremonies this spring. This is not normally a meeting where we would address public input, but then again, these aren't normal times. With that being said, I have shared all the questions and concerns with Lori Putnam, the Assistant Superintendent of Secondary Education. And Lori and Willie have already been responding to these concerns from families in writing and by phone. And Lori also stated that after reading the questions and concerns, they will be addressed in her presentation tonight coming up next. So with that, we will start item B, school updates. It's gonna be by Dr. Lori Putnam Assistant Superintendent of Secondary Education, and Dr. Marsha Baish, Assistant Superintendent of Elementary Education. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Polris, Board of Education members, Superintendent Jot. Dr. Baish and I are glad to provide you with an update on just some of the great things that are happening in our schools right now. Tonight, I will be discussing graduation, other secondary end of year events, grading, and summer learning. Then Dr. Baish will share the elementary update. As Chair Paul Reese shared, some of our families have expressed concerns about how, oops, sorry, I'll wait for Gary to, sorry. Thanks, Gary. You can go into the second slide, thank you. As, uh, keep going. Thank you. As Chair Paul Reese shared, some of our families have expressed concerns about how and why our initial graduation plans changed. I'm glad to have that opportunity to talk with you. Throughout all of our planning, our priority is always the health and safety of our families, students, and staff. Two weeks ago on Wednesday, we shared our plans with you, the board, and the community. These plans aligned with CDC and Minnesota Department of Health guidelines available at that time. But as we know, these are rapidly changing times. And that Friday, MDE issued guidance about what is and is not permissible in graduation plans because we had questions about whether or not our plans met MDE's guidelines, and because we always prioritize safety, we sought clarification from the experts, the Minnesota Department of Health and the Department of Education. On the following week, we communicated with MDH in writing and verbally to seek clarification from an epidemiologist in the State Health Department. They clearly told us our plans did not meet their guidelines. On Saturday, Superintendent Jett spoke with a high-ranking official at the Minnesota Department of Education. Again, we were told no. 
The bottom line from all of these experts was that no plan that brings graduates and families together in person or allows students and families to step outside of their vehicles was either safe or permitted. So we revised our plans to comply with these directives and keep our community safe. We know other districts are doing ceremonies similar to what we had initially planned. And some families are wondering, why aren't we choosing to do the same? Go ahead, Gary. Thank you. A recent communication from the Minnesota Association of School Administrators, otherwise known as MASA, helps to answer this question better than I ever could. This slide shares the response from the president of MASA to state superintendents and district administrators. This response is to MASA members after seeking advice about graduation guidelines and potential implications for violating orders. MASA sought legal advice and their legal team responded in two ways. First, they cited the administrator's code of ethics. And second, they reminded administrators about the executive the directives provided in the governor's executive order. As you can see on this slide, our administrator's code of ethics requires we, quote, take reasonable action to protect students and staff from conditions harmful to health and safety. In this school district, as an administration, we do not violate this code of ethics and our graduation plans follow this code of ethics. Next, you can see the governor's executive order noting that, quote, in-person social gatherings with people from multiple households does not comply with social distancing practices and introduces a great deal of contact unpredictability and increases the potential for disease transmission. These gatherings are not considered safe at any size and will not be permitted. Again, in this school district, as an administration, we follow the governor's executive order and our graduation plans do as well. The communication concluded with a cautionary statement from the Minnesota Attorney General to superintendents who are considering violating or bending the code of ethics or governor's executive order. Go ahead, Gary. So tonight, I'm proud to review our revised graduation plans to celebrate and honor our class of 2020. Our virtual graduation ceremony plays at 7.30 on the evening of each school's graduation, and it includes many of the traditional ceremony elements. These include senior and faculty speeches, commencement addresses from the principal and superintendent, and this year, a speech from one of our board members. A photo of each senior will be shown while their name is read aloud, pomp and circumstances will play, and our own music ensembles will be featured. Additionally, we created invitations to the virtual graduations for students to share with family and friends. We also enhanced our vehicle parade in light of the necessary revisions to our plan and in response to feedback from families. For instance, we will now be handing out diplomas during the parade and we extended the hours of the parade so there'd be no need for families to feel like they had to rush. Parent volunteers are assisting us with decorating school grounds and families are encouraged to decorate their vehicles if they choose. For families who do not attend, we will gladly mail diplomas to their home, though it is not required. The radio station KCLD will do a live broadcast during the parade, and families can call in to congratulate their seniors. The DJ will broadcast each senior's name as the principal hands out the diploma. They'll also hand out a virtual graduation ceremony program and the honors cords. Pop and circumstances will be playing for the seniors as their families drive along the route also along the route, seniors will be treated to a fire truck salute and waves from city officials, district administration, teachers, and staff. We will be sending a communication sharing this and other information, such as a route map, with families in the coming days. We have also planned many, and I mean many other ways to recognize our graduates. One kind parent sent me a grid of our plan compared with other districts plans. And it's helpful to be able to see these laid out side by side. When I reviewed the document she sent, it made me appreciate how thorough and creative our plans are. It also made me appreciate the extensive collaboration from our community. On this slide, you can see the various ways we, the city, and our community are recognizing our class of 2020. I'd like to take a moment to thank Mayor Kleiss for his upcoming proclamations to honor our tech and Apollo seniors 
and for lighting the city water towers with each school's colors on their graduation days. Additionally, the St. Cloud Police and Fire Departments and Chamber of Commerce have been very kind partners to us. As you review this lengthy list of all the ways we will celebrate and recognize our class of 2020, please note that we still have high hopes for bringing our students and families all together to celebrate as a class one last time in July. In addition to graduation, we have other end of year events happening right now. We are collecting school materials and distrib distributing student belongings in yearbooks. Our middle schools have virtual talent shows and spirit weeks and farewell surprises planned for our eighth graders. Our principal school counselors and staff are also creating virtual tours and introductions to our schools to share with our rising sixth and ninth grade students. As you know, we provided families with two greeting options for trimester three. Our administrators asked for additional time to be sure they had time to make contact with each family, so we extended the choice deadline to this Friday. Finally, we are planning summer learning. We will be offering credit recovery for high school students short on credits. We will provide two choices, both done through distance learning to our students. The first is synchronous learning, where students are online at the same time as their teacher and getting direct live time instruction. And the second is asynchronous, which we're doing now, where students check in with the teacher for instruction, assignments and support, but are not always online at the same time. And that was a lot of information shared. So before I turn this over to Dr. Baish, I'm wondering what questions you might have. Al, you're up first. I see that you have one. Uh, is my mic on? Yes. Yep, go ahead, Al. Okay. I have a question. Uh, never before have we ever had a board member speak at a graduation. Is there a reason or how, how did that come about this year? And uh, in, a, in, a, in an elected position, how is it fair to pick one board member and put them in front of the entire groups? I, I mean, I in the past have been chair. I have asked if I could, and it's always been a no. So how did that change this year just suddenly without any discussion? Thanks, Al. That's a great question. Um, when I presented last time, um, the administration was charged with figuring out how we could pr provide some way to incorporate the board into our plans, since typically board members would be handing out diplomas at graduation, you'd be on stage. And of course, this time you have no way to do that. Um, so when I talked with our school administrators, um, their suggestion was to be able to incorporate a speech, a, a, a very brief um, uh, not even a speech, a, a regard to the class of 2020. Um, so we brought, I brought that back um, after consulting with Superintendent Jet to Chair Paul Reese, and that's how that came about. I, I, I would vote, I disagree with that. Strongly. All right, Natalie, you have a question? Uh, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Okay, um, so just thinking in an equity lens, uh, I know there are, are families in our community who don't have access to, trans to their own personal transportation. So can you talk a little bit about um, our plans to still be able to include those students? We talked about it at length as a district and with our transportation department. Um, unfortunately, we aren't able to provide a different um, alternative from a district perspective because now we'd be in violation of crossing multiple households um, within a confined space. Um, so our, you know, unfortunately we are not able to solve um, that issue, um, which is why we, consider we've designed the virtual graduation ceremony as our primary graduation celebration and would be happy to either um, provide the diploma ahead of time or as I said, that again, they'd have to come or would be happy to mail it. Well, just an idea off the top of my head and maybe we can't do this for a whole host of reasons, mm -hmm. but, um, and again, this is the same thing of parents would have to ask for it, but if we have a family um, with a graduating senior that does not have access to their own car and can't get one, 
is there a way we could provide an Uber or a Lyft for that family? I, I mean, I'm happy to buy them, <laughs> you know, but I, I know that, that um, you know, that would be me doing it on my own. So how do we, how, is there a way we could do that from a school perspective? Thank you, Natalie. I would have to talk with um, folks who understand transmission better than I do, um, because then we would again be encouraging a cross of households. Um, we, you know, we aren't. It, it would be very challenging for us to know if one of the drivers um, had any health issues, and for us to be putting a family in, in again close proximity. Um, I, I think it could be challenging, but I would be happy to bring that question back for clarification. Thank you, Laura. That's that's very true. I thank you. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Les, do you have any questions? Uh, Jeff. Yeah, I um, I want to agree with Al. I, I think that uh, uh, while I think it's a it's a nice gesture, um, there's um, I don't I don't want a crisis to create. A situation where we, we we now have a controversy. Um, I think we should re, we should rethink the issue of having a board member speak. I think that uh, we could, uh, if board members want to offer congratulation or something like that, that could be a part of a, a signage somewhere or a, or a picture somewhere that would make sense. But I think we're we're having a board member speak is um is a needs much more thought than uh, than just to be you know, demanded by a crisis right now. thank you dr green we i know are able to remove things from the virtual ceremony so based on your feedback i'd be happy to have a conversation with superintendent jet following and i believe that would be an easy change to make thank you Lori. i would like to add that i think it would be equitable if each board member was given 15 seconds with a little congratulatory message and run through all seven of us so we could say congratulations to the each of us a little independent and then string them all together and that's a message from your board but to choose one member and put them in front and to spotlight one member just isn't uh that's just it's just on it's I don't know how to put it. It's just not right. I appreciate that, Al, and and certainly I hear and feel. I feel um, that we need to reconsider that decision. Um, I know our our deadline for the virtual graduation ceremony has passed. So whether or not we can, um, like I said, it's easier to remove than to add. So I don't know that we're able to add anything, um, but we can absolutely remove something. We are, uh, Dr. Putnam. We are able to edit and add because tomorrow morning I'm redoing mine. Wonderful, thank you, Superintendent Jot. I mean, I'm sorry I had to redo your speech, but thank you for that information. Okay, dope. Can I add something that, could we send out to the other board members, the calling it a speech is not an exact term for what it was. It was a, a very short congratulation message on behalf of the school board. It was probably only a few sentences, but if we sent that message out to the board members to just start that conversation and say, okay, this is what was said, do we need to retract that or to add something to it? Absolutely. Because it wasn't a speech. Thank you, Shannon. We'd be happy to do that. All right, Monica, you have any questions? Yes, um, I have a comment about um, Natalie's concern in terms of uh, people having vehicles to attend the parade. Um, I, 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 I do appreciate the concern. I think that there are people that might have um, issues about having a vehicle to be there and participated. I'm also concerned about the district providing those vehicles. And I would like to maybe ask in, uh, the administration to find out will be the people that may need them and cannot find any other alternative on ground, any other family member or somebody else that uh, provide them to with with that. Um, it's, it's kind of coming too fast around. And I don't think that there is enough time to plan for that. Um, so I do have a certain concerns about how do we do that? And, and I'm not sure a, 
coming up with that coming up with that right now is 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 not going to have any other issues um so just wanted to express that concern as well and uh, i also want to say i all i love your idea of having each board member um uh, having to say something in a fraction of a second um i think that is perfect is is a great idea and i really applaud to have that idea i completely agree with what you just said thank you shannon any questions no i'm good thank you for the information and passing this along zach any questions No, no questions. Thank you. All right. I guess I'll be last. Um, Al and Les, I hear your message. Uh, it was asked that I videotape a 30 second message. I get where you're coming from, Al, if that's breaking precedent and breaking history. I would just recommend that no board member do it and let's just put something on an email or a, a flyer or a handout or a signage. You know, it'd be easier and logistically, it'd be a lot easier just to take our two out because you got to get caps, gowns. It, it, it's we're behind the eight ball on that. So that would be my opinion on it. Um, any other thing from you, Lori or Marsha? Marsha has yet to go, so she'll be coming oh, up as soon as we're done. Are you done then, Lori? I am. Thank you. All right, Marsha, you're up. Thank you, Chair Paul Reese, and good evening, as well as Superintendent Jett and members of the board. Um, mine should be pretty brief. This evening, I'm just gonna share with you some uh, into the year events for elementary, some shining moments, and some thoughts around summer learning. You can go to the next slides. So um, many schools at the elementary level are celebrating fifth grade graduation either virtually or by having uh, fifth grade graduation parades. Uh, schools are also having goodbye parades for the entire school and staff will be standing outside of their buildings just waving to families as they drive by and, and waving goodbye for the summer. Uh, as distance learning has occurred throughout the year, PBIS celebrations have continued. And one example that I'd like to share with you uh, happened at uh, an elementary school in which uh, students honored their either heroes or sheroes by in their lives by dressing up as the, as them and then uh, sharing messages of appreciation. And here you see one young girl um, dressed up as a healthcare worker and with her little note of thank you for keeping us safe. Uh, also, uh, there are going to be distributions of books to um, every student at our Title I schools during device collection next week. Uh, and these uh, are made available as a result of Title funds. And we used um, parent engagement uh, funds because we weren't able to have end of the year parent engagement activities like we typically do. Also, as Lori alluded to, there are virtual talent shows happening at the end of the year as well at some of our schools. Next one, Gary. So some shining moments that I'd like to share with you that have happened during distance learning uh, include social emotional learning supports at Lincoln and Tawahi, their teams have split all of their families between the two schools amongst their SL, their social emotional learning teams. And the teams have done a minimum of one connection with every single family each week, serving as advocates by supporting technology needs, uh, providing uh, support in terms of access to food, providing again, social emotional learning support, and doing an amazing job of making homeschool connections for families and students. There have also been virtual field trips. It's been really fun to see pictures. And here you see some pictures of a dairy farm. And one of our teachers, who, parents actually own a dairy farm. And so she went out to the dairy farm, took pictures and took her students on a virtual field trip, showing how cows are milked and crops are grown that support uh, a dairy farm. 
And so that was really fun to, to watch. Another one included a teacher going into the woods near her house and giving lessons on pine cones and needles from the various trees that were in the forest. Uh, another one that I had an opportunity to see was of a river field trip. And the teacher was showing eagles that were nesting in a tree and pointing out why they nested so high and sharing facts about eagles and incorporating writing assignments and so on. Uh, also, um, uh, so music was a topic tonight, right? And uh, in eighth grade class at Kennedy played the song 76 Trombones via individual flip grid submissions. Um, we also, as Lori alluded to last week, um, started WIN days. And WIN means what I need or stands for what I need. And some of the uh, happenings during WIN day include Google morning meets and students in, and uh, uh, teachers are synchronously, as Lori shared, there at the same time. So students get to see each other and classmates get to see each other. Also during this time, teachers work with small groups of students and um, also help students with individual assignments. And then I would just like to quickly share with you a couple stories of gratitude. And one is from a parent and she says this, distance learning has been absolutely amazing for us. My son gets to participate in the same assignments as his peers. And this is a special education student. He gets to take as long as he needs to, to do his assignments. There's no rushing to gym. There's no rushing to lunch or art. There's no timer forcing him to go, go, go. He can take his time to process and think for himself. And every day he is still willing to log on and do it again. And there's no fights, no tears, and no tantrums. Um, the other story is a, from a teacher. And she shares that she has a student in her class who has been really struggling with not being in school. He misses his classroom family, and he tells me about it almost daily. She says that his mom emailed her one day and asked if, if she would be comfortable um, sharing her personal address with this family, as the student wanted to send her something. She easily provided the home address and assumed that she might just get a card in the mail. Well, then one Friday afternoon, her doorbell rang, and there at her doorstep was the student with a gift basket and a card for her. And she said in all her 20 years of teaching, this was probably the most memorable experience of her career. Gary, you can go on to the next slide. And I'll just share with you briefly what we're thinking about at the elementary level in terms of summer learning. This is preliminary. We are just in discussion as uh, we know that uh, it was just last Friday that we got guidance from MDE. What we're thinking of doing is uh, doing three weeks uh, looking at starting in late July and early August. Uh, so the last week in July and the first two weeks in August during synchronous learning, uh, having a one to 10 ratio, one teacher to 10 students, and that the curriculum would be focused around in success. Any questions? Al, you have any questions? No, sir. No, sir. Last? No, thank you, Al. Um, uh, Jeff. Monica? No questions. Natalie? You know, I don't have any questions, but I didn't hear that last part about um, synchronous learning, but maybe it was just my internet. She kind of- No, it was mine too, I think. Would you mind repeating about the last it, what I'm gonna, your presentation, Marcia? What I'm gonna ask is, Marcia, just so you know, yours is frozen. So oh. if you could repeat that again, please. I'm happy to. Can you hear me? Nope. nope. It's still frozen. Natalie, give her a call tomorrow. All right. Right on. If she can just maybe email it to us, that'd be great. There you okay. go. Thank Jen, you. Any, anything besides that comment? Zach? Nope. Thank you. All right. 
Thank you, Marcia. That was a great presentation. Thank you, Lori. We will move on to the next item, item number C in our information items. It's a potential review consideration for fall planning. It's going to be done by Willie Jett, our superintendent. Good evening, Chair Paul Race and members of the board. Um, as we all know, these are uncertain times that call for some unprecedented, unprecedented responses from our schools. And as educators, we need to be nimble in our planning and vigilant in ensuring we meet all the needs of all of our students and families. As we make plans to finish out this school year and implement summer learning, we are also planning for what the fall might bring. And so tonight, I want to give you a brief glimpse into the considerations that are going into planning for the start of the 2021 school year. One of the things that Gary has up there, so Gary is being my Vanna White at the moment, and he has this big, huge document. It's a working document. So um, it, it's something I'm going to be referring to. So when we consider what the fall might look like, um, we've identified four options or four scenarios. And the first scenario is, the first one is school will open in person for all students and staff, but with the health and safety precautions necessitated by COVID-19. Second scenario, um, we would open with a partial return of students. Uh, some people would say a hybrid, and it might involve an alternating day schedule for students where a portion come on one day while the other learn through distance learning. A couple of our execs today, one of them in particular had this this thought process or this outstanding idea that if it comes to this, we'll share that a little bit later. Um, the third scenario could be we're not able to open schools and we continue with all students doing distance learning and having to implement what we're doing differently there. The fourth is if we were back to school, we're in person, but all of a sudden um, there's a, there's a, we had to shut down due to another or a local outbreak. Okay. As cabinet, we reviewed what each of our departments has to consider or prepare for. And I just want to share, um, yeah, I just want to share a few from each. Otherwise, we'd be here all night. However, for your reading pleasure, like I said, Gary has that master list that you're looking at, and we're going to, and I know that it was mailed out to you earlier today. And again, it's a working document, and we're adding to it constantly. So first and foremost, we must consider the impact of this situation on learning and teaching. We know that distance learning has been challenging for many of our students, and so some will return with gaps in their knowledge. How will we change our teaching to address these gaps? We also know we have learned a great deal, and our <laughs> teachers' capacity to use technology to enhance learning has skyrocketed. We do not want to lose sight of the transformation that has occurred, and we want to capitalize on this. From an operational standpoint, safety and screening. We need to consider social distancing and how we do that in classrooms, lunchrooms, buses, etc. Will we need gloves, masks? Are we going to be taking temp temperature of everybody? How are we going to screen that? What safety protocols will we implement? From a buildings and grounds perspective, we have to establish a routine for cleaning and disinfecting all the places our students and staff are during the course of a school day. From a human resources vantage point, as mentioned previously, the most significant challenge will be protecting the health and safety of our workforce, requiring screening, cleaning, quarantining, and testing for symptomatic staff and contact tracing and response when there is an exposure. The virus threatens to impact a significant number of staff who may be positive, exposed, or vulnerable due to underlying conditions and that will place increasing demands on the human resource system as greater numbers of staff and students return to school. We also have to consider the re-engagement or re-establishing of relationships. How do we provide expanded access to the mental health support? How has this period of social isolation impacted our youth? The bottom line, how do we help everyone re-establish relationships? Next, is activities at the secondary level, which was actually discussed in a joint powers meeting this afternoon. We understand that activities are essential to the physical and mental well being of our students. Yet the Minnesota State High School League has stated that all students might not be able to return to 
and sustain athletic activity at the same time in various regions throughout the state. And there could potentially be variations in what sports and activities are allowed. As for assessment, we basically know that we have to ask these five essential questions. The who, the what, the where, the when, and the how. Is it going to be remote in terms of assessment? What impact will this have on our district test scores? Will the state continue to reevaluate our performance as a district the same way? How might a change to assessments impact students applying to colleges? From a communication standpoint, we will need to flex and adjust the strategies depending upon the scenario that I'm, I've been mentioning before. The overall communication plan for welcoming back staff and students in the fall, for example, will change depending on whether we are back in buildings, distance learning, or the modified schedule. And Amy, I'm making sure that I save the best for last because Amy always says that she's the best or that she's the most important. Sorry there, Amy. I hope you're smiling when I say that. Finally, the budget impact. Potential state funding reductions may result in us having to make budget reductions. Concerns about decreased enrollment stemming from the pandemic could result in a loss of revenue and the possibility of being overstaffed. Again, that's just a preview or a snippet of our fall planning conversations at the moment. And as I mentioned earlier, Gary had the master working document for you to view while I was presenting, and Mary sent it to you, elect the electronic version, earlier today. With that, questions? Al, you'll be first if you have one. <laughs> I always get the first one. Um, that's okay. Um, Willie, I have, one, I have one, a question concerning, so if the state were to back off or to not assess us the same way or to back off, is that would that be an opportunity for us to focus our efforts on some of our shortcomings, uh, maybe putting more effort towards meeting, towards meeting some of what, uh, to, towards meeting some of our shortfalls? Is that making any sense to you? It's like instead of having this broad range of things, if they're going to back off on their assessment of us, could we focus more on reading and math and areas like that? Would there be an opportunity? So, so I, I understand the question now. Um, and so the, the one thing is we're still mandated, and you had um, Lori Posha sitting there, and so we're still mandated um, to cover certain state standards we're still mandated to cover a specific amount of minutes of instruction in certain curricular areas. At the same token, um, what you just said in terms of the ability or the flexibility to maybe take a deeper dive into specific curricular areas, if they relax that, yes, that gives us an opportunity to dream, to imagine, and, and to think about how we could do or how we could conduct business differently for the 2021 school year, correct. Thank you, that's all, that's all, Jeff. All right, Les, do you have any questions or concerns? No, uh, uh, no concerns, no questions for the comment. <clears throat> I like the fact that, um, that we're thinking ahead. You notice I say we, <laughs> I'm, uh, because I wanna join that boat. I, I'm uh, impressed by, uh, by a group of people who uh, who try to anticipate surprises and uh, and and uh, uh, that th that allows them to do the best they can with whatever uh, comes out of the situation next fall. So thank you very much, all the staff. Thank you, Les. Monica. No questions. Thank you. All right. You're welcome, Shannon. Oh. I just, I just want to say thank you. I realize how complicated this is because life changes every week, every day. Um, and it's difficult to plan for something like this because you don't want to get too far ahead of yourself because the rug could get pulled out. So thank you very much for the effort that you're doing to look forward. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Natalie, sorry I missed you. No problem, Jeff. Um, yeah, I don't really have any questions specifically on this. Um, 
Uh, it's great to see, you know, that we have multiple plans because who knows what's going to be happening by the fall. Um, I think the, uh, the one thing I did want to say is when, you know, um, when, when I've been in the, I say in the community, but I really just mean in a Zoom call um, with folks <laughs> as of late, with people from that have kids in all different districts, um, it's been really neat to to hear how um, positive our parents are about what we're doing. Um, it's because we have had so much figured out beforehand with online learning. Um, you know, it, there's just a, a, a big uh, discrepancy between um, what some other parents are feeling in other districts versus what our parents are feeling, and they're so proud to be able to tell um, their friends, no, listen to how amazing 742 is. And and uh, it's been really a, a great moment um, for me in those couple of meetings I've been in. I don't know if this is the right time to ask this question, but I've had some community members um, ask me uh, for more clarification about summer meals. I know we heard we were gonna possibly, I think work with the Yes Network on that, um, but uh, can, can someone explain a little bit more about that so I know how to talk with these community members about that? Gary, or yes, it, please. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah um, we've been working with Jerry Sparby, who's been running the YES Network for a number of years. Um, they're going to run the, the program out of uh, St. Cloud State's kitchen, uh, up to 2,000 meals. And then um, um, we've reserved the Apollo kitchen in case they get over that. And we haven't even started yet. We got the request for Apollo today. So I think the planning is going pretty well. Um, they're gonna run 14 different um, uh, routes. Uh, they asked us where our high volume routes were. So we've been working with them on that. A couple of our cooks are going to be working with them. Um, we're going to be providing any uh, leftover perishable commodities um, so that they can use those and those don't go to waste. And um, th their meals will be hot meals, which will be really nice. So uh, it's a good partnership. Uh, and I believe they're, uh, they're planning on June 1st, but don't quote me on that one. Okay, so just tell parents that we'll be passing out that information um, that the Yes Network will be, will be providing that? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you, Gary. All right, Zach, you're next, and then you'll go back. We'll go back to Monica. I've seen your question. Uh, my questions were kind of answered there. Thank you. All right, Monica. Uh, Gary, could you tell me how many meals do we give out uh, daily right now? And did you, and, and clarify, Yes Network will provide 2,000 meals a day or a week, or what was that? Um, I, I can speak to what we're giving out. Um, every every big lunch that we give out has two meals in it. It's a, uh, a lunch and then a breakfast for the next day. Um, as of last Friday, I believe that we had served uh, around 230,000 meals, um, um, which is, is astounding. You know, that's about... Um, um, you know, our Fridays are our large days with 4,000 meals. Um, and the, um, uh, if it rains out, we have fewer meals that we give out, but it's it's been very popular. As far as the YES Network on how many meals, I, I don't have that information, but we sure could reach out to Jerry Sparvey to, to find out what their plan is. Could we increase that number so if there is the if they are only giving two thousand a day um can we help them to increase that number or that is out of consideration um if i understand your question can we provide the food for it or or the 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 resources um can you can you clarify that a little well, I'm not sure what we'll take if providing the food or if, we need, or if they need resources. So I don't know what we'll take to increase the number of meals that they are 
providing during the summer. I, 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 I don't know what, what would it be if having the schools providing meals is an option or not. So that's kind of what my question is all around that. I'm, I'm, I, I don't know what it would take to do that, but just wondering if, if it's possible to, to look at it or, or what, what is the extent of your partnership with them? Yeah, our, our partnership would be support. Uh, we, we don't want to run a competing program. And so that's why we've opened up our kitchen. We've, we've uh, uh, worked with our staff on anyone that, that wants to work in the summer. Uh, but, but they fill out the paperwork to get the money for the reimbursable. So I, I think, you know, to answer your question is we'll do whatever we can to support them. You okay, Monica? Good. All right. Yes, thank you. Want, okay, thanks, Monica. I just wanted to add uh, to Willie and all the execs and all the team. I mean, I love it when you guys are forward thinking. We're prepared for the un unprepared, which in, is needed nowadays. Um, great work. All right. Chair Porries, can I add one thing? Please do. Okay. And, and so the one, when I went through all the different, um, I was talking about different departments. And so I, I did not say out loud, um, student services or special education department. And the, the one thing that they're doing that um, that's different or that's, that people have to consider this is how to best meet the needs of our students on individual individualized education plans. And, and so that is in the distance learning, that is one of those unique moments in terms of how do you do that? And, and so that's one of the things that our, that, our, that department um, they're doing a masterful job now, but they're thinking in all these different scenarios, what would that look like? So I just want to make sure I threw that out there. Thank you, Willie. Uh, Carol, can I put you on the hot seat? You want to add a couple minutes to that? Sure. Tell us what you're doing. Oh, wonderful. I thought you had a, a question. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, throughout distance learning, what we have done is we've developed what's called individual distance learning plans. And so usually they're an IEP, an individualized education program, and this is an individual distance learning plan. And so what we have done is we have taken their annual IEP and we've looked at the goals that are very practical for distance learning and we've rewritten the plans um, with parents with families in order to meet those goals and objectives and so um, for the majority of our students our students with learning disabilities or students with emotional behavior disabilities students that are on the autism spectrum higher functioning um, the majority of our students follow the same classes the general ed classes through seesaw or schoology and then we have our really unique learners that really can't use seesaw or can't use schoology and so we are doing things uh, we're having more google meets we are um, developing social interaction. We have our speech therapists supporting social interaction. We have our OTs and our PTs that are working on the physical, the fine motor and the gross motor needs. And so we, we really have everybody who was involved in the student's annual IEP involved in their distance learning IEP in some way. Now, we do have students that you know, really are not very active on a, on a device by themselves. And then we have non-licensed staff that are going in and also supporting. They're not going into the student's home, but they're going to um, support the student in accessing things. And so when the licensed staff member is not with them, they, a non-licensed staff member will go in and they'll practice the technology pieces or they'll practice the switch pieces that they use or they'll practice the pieces of of equipment virtually the non-licensed person will talk them through that and then the licensed person comes on later to um to teach new instruction if that makes sense and so there's just a lot of really unique circumstances you know think of think of our students that receive braille that they only read through with braille um, we have our brailleist that works at apollo on site that um, delivers braille materials to students, and so it's just a vast variety of things that we have going on and unique. Almost everything that we have done and the services that we provide, we have thought about in a different way um, in order to do that. So, 
I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, it did. Thank you for adding that detail to it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We will move on to section number three. It's a discussion and our action items. First up is item number A. It's proposed revived board policy 205. We're up for a second reading. No action needed tonight. This will be presented by Shannon Hawes, who chairs the Development Policy and Governance Committee. Go ahead, Shannon. Gary, are you pulling that up at all, or should I just? I have it ready to go if, if you need it. So go ahead, and if there are questions, I'll pop it up. Um, we just added a couple words to one sentence, and I don't have it. Hold on here. Um, is my microphone still on? We yeah, added. You're on, Shannon. Um, shall only be. So under special meetings, 2A, a special meeting shall only be scheduled by the school board when the purpose for the meeting must be dealt with prior to the next scheduled regular meeting of the school board. So shall only be was the addition uh, that we made. Any questions? Uh, Al, any questions? No questions, but I will clarify, we changed the word. It said can only be scheduled, and we changed it to shall only be scheduled. There it is. OK. Les, any questions? No. Monica? Yeah, wait a second. Uh, I'm, I'm just not clear about that entire paragraph. Is, so it means that we only can, that, that we can only, can, can you tell me, Sharon, again, what does it mean this in another language? Sure. The reasoning for the special meeting, we can hold a special meeting if the purpose of the meeting needs to be dealt with immediately that it can't wait until the next scheduled board meeting so typically we have two board meetings every month when something comes up if we are going to consider having a special meeting uh, putting a special meeting in place to talk about something that came up we need to look at that and say can this wait until our next regularly scheduled board meeting because then we need to just put it at the next board meeting, not hold a special meeting for it. But if it's necessary that we have to deal with it immediately, then that's when we would have uh, a special meeting. Okay, so does this preclude us from doing um, maybe a meetings for, maybe, maybe a scheduling a special meetings to deal with close meetings, like for example, if we are doing negotiations, does that does this force us to do the meeting for negotiation only during the regular board meeting? Uh, or can we still do the, can we decide at a board meeting that we will have a special meeting for a closed session? The closed sessions, Gary, are you able to scroll down? There's another section in this policy that talks about closed meetings. Yes, but my question is if the if the closed session can only happen during a board meeting because the special meeting can only because I, I will think that not all of the closed sessions are are urgent. I would say sometimes uh, it depends on maybe we're under a deadline to to make something happen. Right. Thank you. I would say that if we're having it because it's convenient to have it, but it could wait, then it should wait. Uh, but if we have to, if it's a decision we have to make prior to that next meeting, we need to make it right away um, because of some other deadline that's looming, then we would have to have a special meeting or we would call a special meeting. But it, it would be deadline oriented. All right, thank you. 
Natalie, you have any questions? None for me, thanks. Zach? No, thank you. All right, Shannon, thank you and your committee for your hard work on this. It's looking good. I look forward to the third reading. Uh, anything you want to add, Willie? No, thank you, sir. All right. Next up is item number B. It's proposed revived board policy 599. This is also up for a second reading. No actions needed tonight. This is going to be presented by Dr. Marsha Beisch, Assistant Superintendent of Elementary Education. Good evening again. Let me just remind everyone that the change to this policy is in Roman numeral area three, and it is in uh, item three, and it states that the Welcome Center will contact the family and follow procedures outlined in the administrator's handbook when it is time for the student to promote to a new level, elementary to middle school or middle to, middle to high school. And a student may return to their attendance area school at the end of a term, end of school year, by contacting the Welcome Center prior to the designated dates. And uh, I'll just remind everyone that a process was developed, uh, which would include uh, identifying who those students are and calling them uh, in April to determine if they wanted to continue on in the attendance area where they currently are going to school, to middle school or to high school, or if they wanted to go back to their attendance area. Thank you. All right, we'll start over again. Al, any questions? Um, Les? No, thank you. Monica? No questions, thank you. You're welcome, Natalie? No questions, thank you. Shannon? I'm good, thank you. Zach? Nope. Thanks. All right, I have none as well. Thank you, Marcia. Next up is item number C. It's lunch and breakfast prices for year 2020-2021. This is an action item tonight. It's going to be presented by Amy Scullerud, Executive Director of Finance and Business Services. Good evening, Chair Paul Ray, Superintendent Jett, members of the board. <laughs> um, I uh, am not going to present just because it's a the only attachment that's in the board handout um, is a grid that shows comparative lunch prices and those numbers would be really small on the screen, but it was in the agenda, um, in the agenda packet, um, just for your information. So people have an idea as to where our current lunch prices um, compared to as it relates to our neighbors. Um, one disclaimer, we're doing this a little bit earlier this year. A lot of times we bring the lunch prices in June, um, but we brought this to board finance committee um, and there's a recommendation. And so we're kind of out ahead of our neighbors. And so a lot of times we'll have um, comparisons about what our neighbors are doing for next year. Uh, and so you'll notice that the spreadsheet this year doesn't have um, the 2021 prices for our neighbors. Um, I will say that I've, I've talked to um, the business office staff at all of our neighboring districts. Um, and it's kind of a, a hodgepodge. Some are looking at no increases. Um, some are looking at increases up to 10 cents. Um, unfortunately, those are all kind of uh, confidential office staff recommendations at this point. And so boards haven't um, approved. And so we can't share that comparing information publicly. Um, but just for your awareness, most of our um, neighbors are also looking at proposing um, at least from an administrative standpoint, proposing increases um, to prices as well. And so what uh, what is being proposed and what um, was agreed um, as a proposal to bring forward coming from the board finance committee was to increase lunch prices by 10 cents um, for both student and adult and then breakfast prices by 5 cents. Um, just a little bit of background about lunch prices. There's a, a what's called the paid lunch equity tool. Um, that the federal government actually requires states to use, um, which usually will force a 10 cent increase annually uh, if you're not at a certain uh, minimum threshold. We are not at that federal minimum threshold for what they say we should be charging for paid lunches. We have been able to um, not have to do the increases in the last few years. Uh, there's been a state uh, waiver or the a waiver that's been put out and that the states communicated uh, that allows districts if they have a surplus fund balance in their food service fund to not 
force a price increase if they already are operating in a surplus. Um, technically, that waiver goes off of what your surplus was as of 1231.19. We still have a healthy surplus as of 1231.19. However, uh, our current fund balance, which was 450,000 approximately at the end of last, um, at the end of the last fiscal year, we are expecting will be gone as we reach the end of this year. Um, just with uh, particularly in districts that have high free and reduced lunch um, reimbursements, those re reimbursements are significantly higher than the reimbursements we're receiving under the summer food service program for the meals we're delivering right now. Um, even after uh, utilizing the reserves in the food service fund, um, we're still likely facing um, a deficit beyond that uh, that will require a transfer in from um, another fund, likely the general fund or the food service fund. Um, those recommendations as we close out the year and have a better picture of where we're sitting financially uh, will come forward to the board um, at a later time. So the general consensus was, um, number one, next year at this time, we're, we won't meet the paid lunch waiver requirement um, because we won't have a surplus more than likely. Uh, and so in the interest of um, trying to get the, the food service fund back to a healthy position, um, knowing that we have salary increases because we have two-year contracts and so we know we have salary increases for next year. Um, we also know that we uh, will likely see food costs increase because they do every year. Um, and so the recommendation is to, um, is to provide an increase. Um, it, you know, it's not necessarily going to um, completely cover um, ourselves going into the future um, if for some reason we face reductions or um, don't get increases in our federal reimbursement rates. And that's a, a big unknown at this point too. Um, so that is the recommendation. Um, are there any questions? Um, we will start off by looking for a motion to accept the price increases as discussed. Jeff, I would move to accept the price increases as discussed. All right, do I I'll have a second? This is now. All right, now is there any Thank you, Les. Now, is there any discussion? Uh, we'll start alphabetically again, Al. Any discussion, Al? Oh. Okay. Last, any other discussion from you? Monica? So, yeah, so Amy, what are the implications of not having the increase right now and doing it next year instead? Um, I, I think the main consideration is that um, we're likely looking at um, a shortfall in revenue next year. We don't have reserves that we can tap into and we know that we have um, salary increases and food increases next year that we have to cover. Um, and so outside of generating new revenue or making, making, making budget reductions, those are really the two options. Um, and we're, we're not staffed at a, at a position right now with our participation where we feel we could really make significant staff reductions. Um, and so just in order to be prudent financially, um, the recommendation is to increase um, those paid lunch prices for next year to offset those costs. And what would be the impact per, per lunch per person per student? Yep, so it's 10 cents. Um, and so, you know, it's assuming that we have a normal year where we operate at um, 168 instructional days um, on the or 169 instructional days on the calendar, um, you're looking at just under $17 um, per student is the cost for lunch um, to offset to account for the increase. Any, anything else, Monica? Not right now. Natalie, you're next. Uh, yeah, you know, I um, this is something that I won't be voting yes for. And the reason, and I understand fiscally the reason why we're here. Um, but at the same time, to know what's happening in our community and with our families um, and how many people, um, you know, either can't work or um, have been able to work or have been able to even access unemployment because they are um, gig workers. 
And I know that you know our, our state did did allow for gig workers to access unemployment, but um, you know if you are if you are a gig worker and a W two worker, and you know like I know one of our parents in the district, her um, their uh, well anyway. Long, I can go on and on about that, but you all understand the, the the financial situation that a lot of our families are in right now. So I think um, this would be really difficult to for our, a lot of our families to swallow. I understand that for our free and reduced lunch uh, families, this isn't the issue. However, uh, folks who are on that bubble right over free and reduced lunch, um, this will this will be really difficult for them, especially at this time in our community and in our nation and world for that matter. All right, Al, your mic's on. Um, anything else, Natalie? Are we done? Okay. Um, Shannon, you're up next. I'm good, thank you. Zach, do you have any questions or concerns? No, thanks. Okay, I'm good also, because I'm on that committee. Is there any other discussion before we vote? All right, um, Shannon, you wanna take roll call, please? Sure, Shannon Haas is yes. Monica Segura Short? Nay. Zach Dorholt? Yes. Les Green? Yes. Al Dahlgren? Yes. Jeff Polries? Yes. Natalie Ringsmoo? No. Zach Dorholt, did I get you? Sorry. Yep, got Zach. All right, thank you, Shanna. Yep. Uh, measure passed five to two. We will move on to item number D, which is also an action item. It's uh, proposed revisions to the 2020-2021 school calendar. It's gonna be done by Tracy Flynn Bow, Executive Director of Human Resources. Go ahead, Tracy. Good morning, or good afternoon, good morning. It feels like morning. Uh, good afternoon, board members. Um, what we're looking at is a revision of the school calendar. Uh, as cabinet started looking at all of the uncertainties that are happening as we um, work toward the planning for the fall, it seemed like this was not the year to start a week early before Labor Day. Uh, and so uh, we, several of us on cabinet, spent some time reviewing the calendar with the goal to try to push um, some of those instructional days back inside the, the time from Labor Day until Memorial Day. So that would give us an extra week of time in the event that we have to do planning work or other kinds of retraining work with teachers or whatever it might be that's required to be prepared to re-enter school in the fall. Uh, and so the calendar that you have in front of you accomplishes that. Uh, as you can see, the days that needed to be addressed really were the student days from August 31st to September 4th, those five student days. And so we looked for opportunities inside the calendar to be able to compress those days back inside, um, inside the calendar. Uh, we were able to do that by adding November 3rd. If you look at November 3rd, um, that day is now, that should be shaded in. I think the version I sent you recently has that shaded. Um, but the November 3rd day is a virtual learning day as well as a PD day. Um, one of the reasons we kept that a virtual learning day is because it is election day and it's a difficult day to have students in, in session when we have members of the public coming to our buildings for voting. And so the students will be doing a, a distant learning day like they've been doing uh, this spring and uh, teachers will launch those le lessons and then engage in PD in our buildings that day. Uh, the next day that we were able to pick up was November 25th. And I think, Gary, you're displaying the earlier calendar. That was the earlier proposed calendar. Yep. Give me one second. I'm going to swap them. Sorry. Um, that's what was happening. So on November 25th was the next day. That November 25th is the day before the Thanksgiving break. And that was originally scheduled as a half day of teacher workshop time. Teacher workshop time for board members is time for the teachers to work on grading at the end of the trimester. Uh, 
So rather than that being a teacher workshop day, we have made that an early release day. So we will have, again, another instructional day with students. And then the early release time, the two hour early release time can be used by teachers to do their grading at the end of that day. The next day that we recaptured was January 19th. January 19th was originally scheduled for professional development for teachers. And now instead of professional development, that is just a regular instruction day for students. The fourth day that we recaptured was on April 5th, and that was spring break Monday. Um, it's not a holiday in our school calendars during negotiations this year. We recognize that that would be a good day potentially to keep as a um, snow makeup or weather makeup day um, based on our marvelous experience with uh, with distance learning. We now know that we don't need snow makeup days anymore. Um, and that day was a non-student contact day. Uh, so we were able to make that an instructional day as well. And then finally, the um, school year was scheduled to end on May 27th. Um, so we were able to capture May 28th as the last day of school. So that helps us get the five instructional days that were lost. The um, teacher days um, shift from the week of August 24th just to begin the week of August 31st. And that's a more typical schedule for us with teachers coming back that last um, week of August and the beginning of September. Uh, and then the other thing I would point out on the calendar is we moved the teacher workshop time that was supposed to be on um, that day before Thanksgiving break to, to September 3rd. Um, that first week preparing before students come is always a week that teachers are um, anxious to have more time preparing their classrooms and being ready for students. Uh, and that may be particularly true this year as we may have new procedures and protocols and new ways of doing business. So that additional time will be helpful for teachers at the start of the year. And then you'll see two professional development days at the end of the calendar on June 2nd and 3rd. Uh, those days, although they're marked on the calendar there because uh, by pushing those instructional days onto days where um, staff were previously reporting, um, on those days for professional development, we moved those to the end of the calendar. And now staff, we've worked with the um, SCEA, I should say that about the entire calendar um, revision has been reviewed by um, the president of the SCEA and, uh, and they acknowledge both the dilemma we're in and, and the rationale for making these changes and they had a chance to review it and, um, and, and thought that we had done the best job we could inside this calendar to make that work. But we proposed that um, June 2nd and 3rd would be days for that we would flex throughout the school year rather than doing PD with teachers on June 2nd and 3rd. Uh, the learning and teaching department and our assistant superintendents would have the opportunity to craft um, relevant professional development in a digital learning kind of on-demand format, 90 minutes per month. And so each month could really be tailored to what is relevant for teachers during that particular month. And we would make that available by uh, for teachers each month. And they could do that at the a time of their choosing, which also meets a need that we often hear from teachers for more choice and more flexibility in how to accomplish their PD. So those are the changes to the calendar. We're um, looking for a motion to approve that calendar um, this evening so that we can publish it out to families and the and the community. And I'm happy to take any questions from board members. All right. Do I have a motion to accept the changes to the calendar? So moved. Do I have a second? I'll second. second. Zach, okay. So Natalie and then Zach, is there any discussion or questions? We'll start off with you, Al. No questions. Les? No questions. Thank you. Monica? Yes. Yeah, so um, right now we don't have weather makeup days because we had a pandemic and then everybody had to do online learning. But I don't think that we have really evaluated how online learning has been um, equitable to everybody and accessible to everybody and the best thing to do. So I'm concerned about not leaving um, a snow days there. And, and I do understand that this is three days only or, or a couple of days. Um, but but, I, but I'm I, in cases like that winter that we had like a week, entire week or something else, 
that um, we had to cancel the school and uh, coming in the in, in other times. Um, I'm, I'm really concerned about that. So I, I wonder if I can get more explanation from maybe Lori or or um, or, or Lori or Marsha um, about about that rationality to get rid completely of snow makeup days or wear makeup days. I can jump in. Um, you're right, Monica, we need to continue to evaluate how this is working. I think if we go to this and we do have snow days, hopefully we won't have a full week off for snow or for cold weather, but we may. And you know, if we know in advance, we can send home devices. Gary does have a plan that he's been working on with Amy to um, purchase some additional devices. So that will be less of an issue next year. We will have more devices available for students to make that more equitable. We can also look at having some of the options like we did this year in place that are um, paper pencil types of um, boards, choice boards that would be ready for our students who don't have access to devices. The other thing I would just add to that, Monica, is that there's nothing that prevents the board from declaring snow day makeups on June 2nd or 3rd. I think, again, that's one of the benefits of having pressed those instructional days tightly inside the Labor Day to Memorial Day holidays, um, because there still is that opportunity in the first week of June um, to, to, to schedule snow days if we were to need those weather makeup days. All right, thank you, Tracy. Monica, anything else? Yes, um, so a follow up on that, Tracy. Uh, that's, that's great to know. However, would it be possible to just have it um, um, not mandated? I mean, to have a combination, to have a day extra and a uh, to, to decide that? I'm concerned about families receiving the schedule and not seeing that, and then seeing that the board decides to have a makeup day later on. And, um, and and then that will generate more, uh, I think that controversy and, and people not satisfied with that. So I, I, I would prefer actually, if we do something right now that, that we don't use it, than to have to add another day um, during that time. And especially when, since we haven't evaluated this. So is that a possibility? Um, a change that we could make if that's the board's direction is to on those days, June 2nd and 3rd, since we know those aren't actually PD days, we intend to flex those days into the um, school year. Those could be marked certainly as weather um, makeup days. Thank you. I would support Thank that. You. Good morning. All right, Natalie, you're up. Uh, I didn't have any questions, but thank you, Monica. I um, do support that as well. All right, Shannon. Okay, sorry, Tracy, can you clarify again? We're discussing two different <coughs> options. Uh, what are they? So um, it, on the calendar that uh, we've proposed for this evening, if you look at June 2nd and 3rd, those are marked as PD days. Those were marked largely just so that we did not lose track of the um, of the teacher service days that are required under their contract. They're, they require the 178 days, including four um, um, PD days. And so that's why those are marked there. Um, but our plan and our intention is to flex those days throughout the school year with on-demand learning at 90 minutes a month. Um, so that teachers can be doing that um, more flexibly and not plan to be in service on the second and third. So they're marked there so that as we all were looking at counting all the days on the calendar that are required both for student instruction and for teacher service days, we had all the days covered. Um, but we certainly could add the wavy lines that used to be on the weather makeup days to those days as well. And so it would be clear that they are um, reserved for weather makeup days in the event the superintendent and the board um, decided that that was required at the end of the school year. But if we were to decide that, are we saying that we don't want to exercise a distance learning day on a snow day? 
I don't think you're committing to that by marking those days. I mean, historically, we've always had a couple of days marked for weather makeup days, and it has been the judgment of the superintendent um, in consultation with the school board to decide whether or not we would use no makeup days, whether or not we would excuse um, weather days, or whether or not we would use virtual learning days. That would be a new option for us, obviously, with the new competency of our teachers. And so I think all of those options would remain available. And what I hear Monica suggesting is that by marking them on the calendar, at least gives um, families and teachers, for that matter, fair warning that those days may turn into instructional days if uh, if weather gets unusual and, and it seems in the best interest of all to be able to extend the school year those extra two days. And so I, I think that's a fine suggestion. It doesn't require any substantive change to this calendar. Um, I would just ask that uh, the, the dentist that helps us with this work in, in the print shop uh, or in the, in the media department would help us put those markings on those days. Okay, thank you very much for that clarification. Zach, do you have anything? Anything, Zach? No, I do not. Thank you. Tracy, I have uh, one question. Um, say we do what you just said, the latter part, but yeah. in September and October, November, we're doing the 90 minute professional development training stuff. How is that contractually going to affect it as when it comes time to have them work two more instructional days? It doesn't because the, the instructional days would only be there if we cancel an instructional day during the school year because of the weather. Okay. All right. All right. Um, do we want a motion to accept the revisions or do we want a motion to accept the revisions as slightly changed? Is that what I'm hearing from the group? Is that yes. okay for you, Tracy? Yes. Okay. So I will ask for a motion to, step, to accept the revisions as now discussed. So we would have that variation that was Tracy just eloquently explained. Do I have a motion? So moved. Okay, that was Natalie. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Zach. Thank you. Shannon, would you take roll, please? Shannon Haas is yes. Zach Dorholt? Yes. Al Dahlgren? Yes. Jeff Polris? Yes. Les Green? Yes. Natalie Ringsman? Yes. And Monica Segura Schwartz? Yes. All right, thank you, Shannon. Next up is number four. Superintendent's report can be done by our superintendent, Willie Jett. Thank you, Chair Polris. Okay. First and foremost, members of Tech High School's HOSA, Health Occupation Students of America, that student organization, they participated in an unprecedented Minnesota HOSA virtual state leadership conference this month. The event typically draws over 300 students from 25 plus schools around the state and give students an opportunity to participate in over 50 different competitive event offerings, as well as attend educational sessions and network with other students and professionals who are passionate about healthcare. While this year's conference was significantly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, the virtual offering did allow students to at least compete in the events they have been preparing for all year long. The following students, Brianna Doom, Marty Merrick, Jacqueline Merchelowitz, Holly Peterson, Amanda Peterson, they were they scored or received a first place in public service announcement, which is a team event. A student, Tamwana Ajay, was second place in the human growth and development qualifier. Rachel Matz, she finished third place in the sports medicine qualifier. And Grace Miller, Brielle Tesmer, they received fourth place finish in health career display, another team event. And Aubrey Nistler, she received fifth place in medical spelling. Congratulations. I'd also like to wish a congratulations to the following Apollo senior athletes who have signed to play their sport in college. Sam Holthouse at the University of St. Thomas for baseball. Jaden Berry at Augsburg University for football. Libyan Muhammad at Iowa Central for cross country and track and field. Derek Stanich 
at Gustavus Adolphus College for football, Katera Lampert for Gustavus Adolphus College in dance, and Haley Juice, uh, College of St. Benedict for track and field. Congratulations to those Apollos senior athletes. And last but not least, to conclude my superintendent's report, I'd like to wish Natalie Ringsmooth a happy birthday. And that concludes my superintendent's re report. All right, thank you, Willie. Uh, next up will be Board of Education reports. Uh, we'll start off with Board Development and Policy Governance Committee, Shannon. Board Development Policy and Governance had a virtual meeting April 28th, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Uh, present was myself, El Dahlgren, Zach Dorheld, and Marsha Baish. And we discussed the two policies that you heard tonight that for the second reading. I think there were 599 and 205. We meet again, another virtual meeting this coming Tuesday, May 26th. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Next up, Al, do you have one from finance? I do. Uh, the school board finance and audit committee met on May 14th, 2020 here at the district office. Uh, president was myself, Amy, Gary, uh, Les was present by phone and Jeff, Scott, Andreasen and Willie were all present. Uh, first, the first item on the agenda was a boardroom update and Gary discussed this project got a little bit delayed because the IT staff has been busy assisting with technology and distribution of, of distance learning. So it's a little bit slow, but uh, over the course of this summer, that will get done. Uh, we discussed the placement. We, we had asked for an extra monitor in there so that the people sitting like myself and Monica and Les, we don't really have a monitor that we can look at except for the one right behind us. And so we asked for another monitor to be placed on the far wall, but instead of doing that, uh, we are looking at the option of just putting a smaller monitor on a cart. And it would be similar to what they have at City Hall where it's down, it would be right down near the floor in front of us. So we would be able to see what's going on without having to turn completely around and have our backs to the meeting. Uh, next, we discussed the summer projects that are going on at the schools, the maintenance projects. Uh, Gary reviewed a list, and it was a long list of things that are going to be done this summer. Uh, we are still waiting on an assessment from ICS for the 10-year long-term facilities maintenance plan, so we're going to be looking at that at a future meeting. And there was a suggestion made that we pay more attention to curbside appeal at our schools. Nutritional services primary vendor contract was up next. Uh, Amy re reviewed the summary of proposals. Uh, we voted on that tonight in the consent agenda, so I won't go through that. 2021 lunch prices was a discussion we had. Again, we had the discussion here tonight. I'm not going to uh, go through that again, but we had a long discussion on that. Next, we had a COVID financial update. Amy reported that most school districts in Minnesota are most worried about their food service and community education fund budgets. Uh, food service fund will have a shortfall and we're serving uh, less meals. The food service fund cannot be in the red at the end of the fiscal year, so a transfer from another, from another fund would likely be required to cover it. The transfer will be brought to the board in August or September for approval. And I, I believe that's even if we do have uh, lunch price increases, um, we're going to need to cover a little bit this year. And it would just be exaggerated again next year. Uh, the overall community education budget has a fund balance of $2,400,000, which is able to absorb any current year deficits as a result of lost fee-based program revenue. She also reported that we're not hiring kindergarten teachers until we see what our enrollment is next fall. So community ed, we are in a very, very healthy position. Uh, other districts are really concerned about it and it's mainly due to the COVID uh, childcare requirements. Um, and because our, our childcare stuff is not done through the district, through our community education program, it's done in cooperation with uh, other groups. Uh, we don't run into the exact same financial difficulties that other districts have. Uh, 2021 budget update. Amy just reviewed our staffing budget. And 
uh, some changes that have been made in the in the staffing budget. In addition, let's see. Uh, she, we always we always estimate very conservative when it comes to staffing. Uh, it's easier to add in than it is to to reduce when you have uh, if you have additional students or additional funding. And Willie sent out a message later last week with some of the changes in administrative staff uh, that everybody saw. And so that pretty much covered it. Our next meeting is this next Thursday, May 28th at 8.30 in the district office, room A, B, and C. And it will be the first, first opportunity for us to see the 2020-2021 budget. That's it. All right. Thank you, Al. Anyone have any questions of Al? Yes. Oh, go ahead, Monica. <clears throat> so I, I just have a comment that um, we just had the presentation of the meal prices, and then you t you said all that uh, you had a large le lengthy discussion during the finance meeting about it and I would have I would have been interested in, in in knowing a little bit more about that discussion before voting for uh, the mill prices not that um, not that I'm going to uh, reverse my vote at this point or, or ask anything different but um, just had a comment about that and if there's anything else that you wanted to add about that I would be uh, I'd like to hear it. Yeah, there isn't really anything else to add, Monica. A lot of the discussion that we had is the same discussion that we had this evening. Um, we discussed, you know, the, the different scenarios, and it always came down to the fact that we're looking at this year, at the end of the year, having a shortfall in the lunch budget, and it would be exaggerated again next year if we don't do something. And because that fund has to be a pot, you can't have a negative fund balance in your lunch program, that would mean that we would have to shift dollars from some other budget, uh, like general fund budget over into the lunch program uh, budget just to cover the shortfall so that we would statutorily meet those requirements. And to none of us did that seem as though it was a, an acceptable thing to do because I don't know where within our other budgets and our other programs we would go to take that that funding away. And I mean, there's, if there's something out there that's not important to us, I guess it probably shouldn't be there anyway. Um, and we have all kinds of needs within the district. So, I mean, that was, it was really, it was just a discussion on, on that. And we, again, we had it again this evening in our lunch discussion. So it was a very similar discussion, but it went on for quite a while in finance committee also. All right. Thank you, Al. Les? I can barely see you, but do you have a report for us? I'm, uh, I'm sorry, it's dark. I'm still in the car, and uh, <laughs> my temperature gauge says 100 degrees outside. That's because I have to have the thing running in order to run the computer, oh. and it, and, uh, <laughs> so it's hot. Um, I had a report. I don't have the. I have a different computer. I don't have the the notes here, and so what I'd like to do is just postpone the report. Um, until uh, um, the um, um, work session, because it was, you know, uh, it was exciting, but I can't remember why. So, As always. <laughs> all right. Thank all right. You. No problem, Les. Thanks. We'll look forward to hearing you next time. Um, Achievement Integration and Equity Committee, Natalie, I know you have one. Yes, I do. So I um, did send out our uh, notes from our committee meeting yesterday. Uh, the committee meeting was yesterday. I sent out the notes today, as well as an, uh, another document I wanted the board to be able to review. Um, committee members were all in attendance. Myself, Monica, Zach, Lori Putnam, Lori Posh, Al Johnson, Marsha Baish, um, Sylvia Huff, uh, Dr. Sylvia Huff, and Lacey Welkin. Um, so we discussed a couple items. The main thing, uh, the two main things we discussed were American Indian education uh, in terms of the board document for the non-concurrence plan. Mm -hmm. So this is something that um, will be coming to us in our next meeting for signatures. Just to talk with you about the timeline for this document, 
Um, Lacey uh, did draw it up and um, we talked about it at our, at our committee meeting yesterday. And then um, she sent out the draft to myself and I sent it out to you guys today, uh, board members. Uh, and I would like you to review that. Here's the timing piece. Our signatures are due to MDE by June 15th. So any questions or concerns that you have, if you could get those, um, either let, them, let me know them right now if you want or get them to, uh, um, to me or to Lacey or maybe both of us via email, uh, just so we can make sure that when we come to our June 3rd board meeting that um, we don't have folks that are unwilling to sign because maybe they they have a question or they wanted something, a wording changed. Um, they, uh, because our next board meeting I think is June 17th, which would be after uh, the document is due to MDE. So uh, Lacey is actually going to be presenting at our June 3rd board meeting, um, but just basically um, not really take questions on this specific document uh, to really say here, here are the main items you're working on and here's how that's had to change, of course, because of um, distance learning and here's uh, the plans for the future. So we're always uh, wanting to move towards concurrence, of course, um, with our American Indian education and uh, we, we really appreciate that uh, Lacey and this committee is willing to continually um, take steps in that direction. And uh, so we, as a board can uh, be held accountable for um, the non-concurrence vote by the parents. Uh, the discussion item that we then talked about was what Lori Posh presented tonight, the curriculum view, review. Um, and so I'm not going to go into any of that. It was a very similar discussion to what we had tonight. Um, and then uh, next meeting, we're going to be talking about our topics for um, the next. Um, the, we have our topics for the summer, but we're going to talk about topics for the fall. So one of our main um, uh, concerns with this specific committee, and I think I've raised this before, was that um, what, if a new board member takes it over in January, sometimes the um, the focus of it changes. And so we're really working hard this year to say, what do we need to do every year? How do we need to check in? Who needs to be the one to bring that to us and uh, make sure we, we continue to have a, a pretty clear plan of what we want to do every year in, um, in, the, in this committee meeting, but also be able to flex as well uh, if we need other items to be discussed um, at our committee meetings. So our next meeting is Tuesday, June 16th at the wonderful time of 8 a.m. Uh, I think it'll be on Zoom, but I guess we'll just have to see. So any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Anyone? All right, seeing none, we will move on to item number five. It's future agenda items. Um, for our upcoming board meeting, we will have item A, it's going to be a discovery school presentation. Item B, it's tentative, but we'll have a facilities update. Item C will be a preliminary budget presentation. And item D, as Natalie just stated, will be the American Indian non-concurrence documents. Uh, with that being said, it is 9.25. I'll adjourn tonight's board meeting. Everyone be safe and good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everybody.